I call the uh, May 3rd study session of the Littleton City Council order at 6.30. Uh, all of council is present except for Mayor Pro Tem Ryden, who should be here shortly. Um, so tonight we've got two study session topics, uh, the inclusionary ho housing ordinance progress, and then the second one is open space master plan update. And so the first one here, we've got uh, representatives from South Metro Housing, the Housing Task Force, Root Policy, and the city here to get us up to date. Uh, and Mayor Pro Tem Ryan has just walked in. <laughs> Making her we can entrance. start the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we're gonna go through and see what the uh, Housing Task Force and has come up with here with some recommendations on uh, an inclusionary housing ordinance and get some direction from council if we're okay with the two-tiered step that they've kind of um, shown us and get some more feedback, so. Turn it over to Mark. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just reflecting a little bit here about this issue here. And, you know, of course, our comprehensive plan talks about the partnerships that are necessary for us to kind of deliver on the long-term goals of this community, and this is one of those issues. And so we have, obviously, our task force, so welcome. And we're going to get a progress report on that. And so I'm going to turn it right over to Kathleen Osher out of the city manager's office. And uh, Kathleen? So good evening, Mayor, members of Council, Kathleen Osher, Community Services Director. Um, as Council will remember, one of your goals, goal number six, housing and livability, includes both support of the ongoing housing task force, which was started in 2017 to help usher in a, a study relative to housing, as well as a series of recommendations adopted in 2018, and then fully incorporated into the comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2019. So that outlines a series of goals, policies, action steps to deliver on a housing um, sort of strategy for the city, you know, much as our city manager, Mark Ralph, often talks about, you know, we have this mobile of overarching plans and housing is one of those to, to hang off of our 20 year uh, attempt to both manage growth as well as think about where the needs are for our residents and businesses. Our housing strategy we know is going to dovetail into our economic development strategy uh, because we know that that is a huge concern for our employers here in the city. Um, being able to find housing. We also know that being able to live and work in Littleton reduces the wear and tear on our infrastructure and the opportunity to reduce traffic I think is something that we hear would be very much supported in the community. Uh, so that is where we are in our process. Uh, we have brought to you some research as part of your February 11th retreat. Um, basically sort of the landscape of options that we see around the region, um, some of the initiatives that have been undertaken along the front range. So we, uh, you know, always are big fans of only um, 
you know, kind of learning from other people and really ushering in policies that we think are going to be successful. Let them make the mistakes and we'll push forward um, and find success that is uniquely Littleton. So tonight I'm joined by Molly Fitzpatrick from Root Policy, Corey Ritz with South Metro Housing Options, and Eric V, the chair per, chairman of our housing task force. So they're going to weigh in throughout the discussion. We have a series of questions, uh, but we're going to start with Molly and she'll walk us through how um, this research has kind of unfolded, what we've seen in terms of other policies, um, but where we see some unique opportunities for people to consider. So. Thanks, Molly. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Kathleen, for the introduction. And hello, Mayor and Council members. It's great to be with you. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, I'll give you kind of the, the really high level, and she covered a little bit of this, just um, uh, project background on this. And so, you know, as we think about kind of the overarching housing strategy, some of those goals and objectives that are both in the comprehensive plan and also coming out of uh, the housing needs assessment, which was done leading up to the comprehensive plan. Um, what we're talking about tonight is one of the specific policies that helps you address those needs. Um, it is not the end all be all. It's not the magic bullet. It is not the only strategy that the city will use. Um, but we are kind of focused on this specific specific tool, which is an inclusionary housing ordinance. Um, as Kathleen mentioned at your retreat, you kind of uh, hopefully you went through the, the memo that we put together that just gives you background on what these are, how they work in different places, some of the legal context, um, which has had a little back and forth in the state of Colorado. Um, but at this stage, uh, kind of all pathways are clear for the city to move forward with whatever is going to be best for the city in terms of um, uh, structuring an inclusionary house housing ordinance. So today I'm giving you kind of a, a little update on our progress and where we are thus far. I'm also proposing um, some recommendations just in terms of how the, the system, the inclusionary housing system would function or could fun function. So we're, that's that two tiered system that we're talking about. We wanna talk about that tonight specifically, but we're not presenting a hard and fast definitive ordinance uh, recommendation in terms of we still feel like there is um, progress to be made on refining exactly where those set asides are, what AMI levels we're looking at, um, exactly what the incentives might be as well. And I know those are lots of housing jargon terms. I'm just gonna throw at you uh, for our discussion. We'll get into what I mean by those as we talk through it. But um, just wanna kind of set the stage, make sure that, that we're getting enough direction that we can really refine as opposed to just continuing to look at, at a lot of different options. So we've got some discussion tonight. I do wanna kind of walk through um, some of the detail. Nothing that I'm presenting is new or is different than what is in the council packet. I'll gloss over a handful of things in the packet as well, but I'm happy to answer questions about those. If you had specific questions as you were um, walking through, we'll certainly touch on those as well. Um, so uh, this is this slide just gives you kind of the, the quick um, uh, reminder on the direction that we received from Housing Task Force going into this project that we're taking into consideration that we are calibrating this to the local market. Uh, we'll talk about ways that, that we've done that and we're looking at it. Um, that it does address needs across, across income levels, so not just focusing on one specific segment. Um, that it does include incentives, it has, or it's based on incentives, um, that it does make building affordable housing attractive, that's really what the incentives do, um, and that it helps use affordable housing as a catalyst for, for housing supply. So that really is that piece where we're trying to leverage that private, private market, um, but not penalize the private market at the same time. So I'm going to start just straight out of the gates with our recommended policy approach, um, and then we'll kind of talk about some of the details that went into dis determining that approach. So um, this is what we're recommending and what we'd like to talk about tonight in terms of a tiered policy proposal. So as you probably remember from uh, kind of working through some of these details and, and policy examples from other communities uh, back at your retreat, um, there are a couple ways you can approach inclusionary. Sometimes they are mandatory. Sometimes they are completely voluntary. Um, and we are basically proposing kind of two tiers. One tier that would be a mandatory option, but that is paired with incentives and fairly low set asides. And when I say set aside, I mean how many units or how much of a fee do you have to give uh, as part of the mandate for affordable housing? So. So we're suggesting let, let's set a fairly low bar, but set it to all development. So that's a mandatory inclusionary option, but let's pair that with incentives. So let's give offsets to developers 
um, to comply with that to make sure uh, that it's not um, creating a, a huge barrier to development. But we also want to make sure that we're providing some really deep incentives to make it really easy for our nonprofit and affordable housing developers. Um, the, those folks that focus on affordable development, that are really good at it, that do it every day, we want to make sure that we're really clearing a path for them. And so we talk about those two tiers. One is, again, sort of minimal but mandatory for everyone, and then big incentives for big affordability. Those are the two tiers that we're talking through. The big incentives for big affordability is, of course, a voluntary, if you're willing to provide a lot of affordable housing, then the city is willing to give you more um, to help offset that. So you mayor. say everyone has qualifying developments. Is the qualifying still kind of up in the air what that is going to be? Is it yes. single family home? Is it multifamily? Is there a threshold that, you know, a person that buys an empty single lot that builds one house on it? Probably there's not a whole lot that. Perfect question. Yes. So when we say qualifying developments, that is still in flux and something that, that we would love your thoughts on as well and something that we're going to continue to talk with the housing task force about. Um, generally, that qualifying development, it most commonly in communities means a certain number of developments. So if you're building fewer than six homes, eight homes, 10 homes, uh, something to that effect, then you could be exempt. There's also ways to structure that where you may just pay a small fee or kind of have a fractional commitment. So there are ways to say, look, we want all developments to qualify. So we're not saying you can't include those, um, but that is often an exclusion um, that is carved out. We would recommend that you do apply it both to for sale and also to renter. Um, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, you know, we do want this to address kind of a spectrum of incomes. And that is the best way to address a spectrum of incomes is to have both owner affordability and rental affordability as well. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank Any you. follow ups? Okay. Um, so yeah, that is not determined yet. So this is the two tiered structure that we're talking about. We're going to come back and, and talk more about that. Um, but I also want to talk about AMI targets. So um, AMI targets are, are where we want that affordability price point to be uh, when we think about affordable housing and inclusionary housing. Um, so typically an inclusionary housing study, there's, there's or an inclusionary housing ordinance, there's two big pieces in terms of the affordable requirements. It's the set aside, how many units do I have to give the city? And it's the affordability level or AMI. It stands for area median income. It just determines how affordable essentially or to what incomes do we want these to be affordable um ami is set at the metro level you can see the table there i'm not going to walk walk through it in particular common breaks or targets are 30 percent 60 percent 80 percent 100 or 120 um, those are set by hud they're metro wide um based on there and there's more detail around these in the report um which we can talk through but but based on kind of a combination of what programs that are currently creating affordable housing, where those thresholds are set. We want to be consistent with those to the extent we can. We also want to acknowledge where are the actual housing needs in the community. Um, and, and we took a look at both the original housing study and the data update to see where that is. Um, rental, that tends to be priced, that tends to be the need, is at 60% AMI and below. With, with the most acute needs really at that 30% AMI and below, um, but for a market type product, we typically go up to 60 or sometimes even 80 on rental. And then the most acute needs um, on the ownership side are 80% AMI. So those are the thresholds that we are recommending. Um, we think about as primary targets. Again, that doesn't mean that all resources that go to housing have to be targeted there. But when we think about kind of a market leveraging uh, policy, which a, an inclusionary is, um, we, we typically like them in that range. And that does align with your current housing needs as well. Well, again, something we can continue 20, to talk about. 2021 numbers, and I think the 2020, 2022 numbers are actually considerably higher. Um, yep, 2022 just came out, um, and they are they bumped up. I think almost by like, by 10, like 10 grand, yeah. probably. I think 100 yeah. percent for one person is 78 now. Is yep. that six out of three? So that's a, for yeah. Yeah, because I think increase. the four person, hundred percent AMI mm -hmm. went from one hundred four, maybe to one fourteen. Is that right? Yeah. And we can get you an updated table on that as well. And yeah, AMI levels really do cool. tick up annually, so they're released annually and they fluctuate. They um, so so again, you know, these are the numbers as of twenty twenty one. They'll move, and so that's why you set it based on a percentage of AMI because that allows uh, the affordable units to move in the same way that other incomes are moving. Hey Molly, can you? Um, I don't know if you have this information or not, but can you? Um, pair up particular professions or jobs sure. 
with these 30%, 60%, 80%. So we can all kind of get an idea about what people's incomes are yep. in so, this area. Yeah, and, and to that point, not to uh, no, please do. just real quick, the, the housing task force with the help of Emily Dykes, who you guys all know, we've put together like a two-pager for you all. It was not done in time to be inserted into the official packet, so I'll follow up with that, but it does show profiles of Mm -hmm. individuals, families, sort of demographic profiles of what would fit into each of these buckets. Mm -hmm. So just for your guys' help. And yeah, range. great point. Um, so just moving through so we can get to more fun discussion. Um, when we talk about set-asides and incentives, um, again, we're talking about how much affordable and at what level, and then what do you get for it, um, essentially, is what we're talking about. I want to walk through just a little bit of background information that we gained as part of our research uh, that helps inform some of our initial proposals around what we can discuss in terms of set-asides and incentives. So we did uh, reach out to developers. So, so our research has been around looking, of course, you know, you saw some of the uh, preliminary research around what is everybody else doing. We've also done research by reaching out to developers and talking about uh, development costs in Littleton as well as development barriers. So what do you as a developer think uh, would be a good incentive to motivate you to provide affordable housing? Uh, where do you see challenges? Um, and, and also to talk through development costs. We've also put together some of those costs, looking at what are the components of cost, how are those changing, how does that relate to rents, how would that relate to different AMI rents, and then also how does that relate to kind of the financial offset of um, some of the incentives we're talking about. But I think the developer feedback in particular is helpful uh, to talk through because that really does help inform what incentives developers might be looking for, uh, both for a mandatory program, but then also in a voluntary sense as well. So transparency and predictability of project approval is a key issue for developers. Um, being able to kind of uh, know that they can move forward with a project and that they can move forward uh, quickly. So the one thing developers talk about uh, a ton is how long does it take me to get through approvals? How much, um, how, how much uncertainty or risk is there in moving forward on a project as well? Uh, we did hear that, that based on the, the ULUC, um, the current zone height along corridors is pretty sufficient. So it's important to note as we think about incentives and, and height bonuses, potentially your density bonuses, there are construction challenges if you go higher than, you know, first of all, going higher than four stories. Um, but even with that, you can still do stick construction on top of a couple stories of podium. So you can actually get up to seven stories without having to move into steel. Once you go above that, um, it, it becomes a completely different paradigm in terms of cost structure and is not likely something that, that developers are seeing um, a high demand for or rents that are high enough to, to merit that. So we're not expecting developers to necessarily want more height than is currently zoned along corridors, though we did hear um, some desire for additional density or height in the downtown area. So leading me to the next one, some potential incentives that developers suggested um, around multifamily developments were process improvements that kind of relates to that first bullet transparency um, and approval speed, uh, parking reductions, um, open space reductions, uh, permit fee rebates. Uh, all of those are fairly common types of incentives in these kinds of programs, and we certainly heard about that um, from, uh, from existing developers as well. On parking reductions, I'll, I'll at least note that developers generally don't want to be told how much parking to do. Um, but they also don't want to do zero parking. They just want to get to decide. So that one, um, I, I think it's important to note as we talk about parking reductions, the market will really still drive how much parking gets built um, because developers don't want to build a project that then someone doesn't want to rent because they can't, don't get a parking spot. So I'll just acknowledge that uh, that kind of comes into play as we think about where to set some of those uh, reductions or incentives. On the uh, smaller scale development side, so not multifamily, single family, we heard about incentives for um, flexibility on lot size. So being able to do smaller lot sizes or narrower lot sizes, lot dimensions, as well as uh, allowance of gentle density. When I say gentle density, I mean like duplex or townhomes, but with similar setbacks um, as uh, single family homes, but in those single family neighborhood <clears throat> contexts. So a little bit of gentle densities there is what we heard from uh, those developers. And then really that that covers kind of the, the slides that I wanted to talk through in terms of context. I realized this slide is really tiny and hard to see. Um, so hopefully uh, you can take a look at it. It's the exact same table that was in uh, the, the packet around this. And our goal here again is 
is not to say this is exactly what we need to do, but we wanted to give you a sense of uh, giving you some numbers to react to as we think about that. And then as we move through discussion on whether or not this structure makes sense to you, we'd also like to talk about, you know, which of these incentives um, make you really nervous, which you think are great, um, what do you think might be missing. So we want to talk through all of those elements. Um, again, this is not set in stone, but I always find it's help more, it's easier to have a discussion when there's something a little concrete in front of you. So just to give you kind of a sense of, of order of magnitude numbers that, that we are looking at based on the feasibility analysis um, are here. So again, that tier one is the mandatory inclusionary with incentives. This is what would apply to all developments uh, with a little asterisk saying you can exclude some. Uh, but you know, as we're thinking about the range of potential set-asides, we think probably the right proportion in there, at least to maintain minimal impact on development, is somewhere between 2% or 8%, two and eight, two, between 2 and 8% of, uh, of rental or for sale units being allocated um, or, or designated as affordable. So that means they would have a contractual income restriction. And then again, our recommendation is at 60% AMI for rental and 80 for owner. Um, when we think about the compliance options, I do want to highlight it is important to have some options for developers. So one option is that you can build it, you can build those units, the whatever that set aside might be, or you can pay a fee instead of building it. Uh, in, in situations of fee collection, that fee has to go toward affordable housing, um, but it is a fee that the city can, can pass straight through to nonprofit partners. The city doesn't have to become a developer or manager of affordable housing. Um, it's just a matter of collecting the fee and then allocating that to affordable housing. Uh, so both of those are, are two options. Where that fee gets set, we've provided some, some detail on how those fees are usually set uh, in, the, in the packet, but really, how you where how high you want that fee depends on what you're trying to incentivize. So if you want to have the the most minimal impact on development possible, you set a really low fee, um, and then developers pay it. You collect some dollars and you move on. Um, but if you set a really low fee, you're not likely to get units built by private sector developers. So that's always kind of a trade off as well that that we want want your thoughts on as well. What's the risk of Having developers pay the fee, like just say all of them pay a fee, and there's not much opportunity to then spend that money on affordable housing and other situations. Um, I, I'm sure Corey would say that risk is low because he would love to spend that money. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. I would say in the city of Littleton, we have, we're landlocked, as we've talked about so many times before. There's only so many sites, and Corey doesn't have an unlimited number of opportunities to go build. Well, that's buildings. my point. If all the sites, if all the, the big development sites, everyone pays a fee, and there's not a whole lot of opportunity for new affordable buildings. Exactly. Which is yeah, certainly a risk. Yeah. Now, uh, housing authority is not limited to just Littleton, is it? No. Yeah, so you could build elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could take the money and hopefully buy property. Well, I, think it's a, I think the goal with Littleton is for not us to give money to other communities to build housing. And preservation of affordable housing was also on the table, mm -hmm. too. So that money could go to buying other properties and turning them into, or pro I don't know if they could go to project-based vouchers or, or what, but there'd be other ways to use that money other than ground up development. Yeah, or just keeping them affordable, you know, what we call sometimes naturally occurring affordable that <clears throat> isn't necessarily subsidized and they go in the market and are purchased by private owners and the rents are raised no longer naturally occurring affordable. So that's something we've been discussing as well and we think is important to, to at least consider. Yeah. It's a key policy question for mm -hmm. us today yeah. for you guys to provide guidance on whether the, you know, Today is a lot about identifying priorities in this policy, and then we'll go back, hopefully, and get really specific on all of these yeah. and hone in everything. And And so we want all of your guys' feedback. Is it a priority to make sure that units are getting built? Is it a priority to make sure that SMHO is getting maximum resources possible to go do what they do? Um, some combination of the two. There's lots of options. For sure. Um, on the tier two, again, that's we're calling that sort of majority affordable. Uh, we're suggesting that threshold at 50%. So if you are mostly affordable, um, then that's what unlocks these additional higher incentives. Um, I'll, I will sort of acknowledge that, that the reality is that most developments that have any affordable are either have a really small fraction of affordable because they're trying to get access to incentives like this, or they're almost completely affordable. So there's very little actually that gets built with affordable units between 20% affordable units and 80% affordable 
affordable units. So we kind of just picked the middle to make sure that if there is a mixed income development, sometimes those are funded with 4% LIHTC, that you're kind of, you're offering that still, but, but just to acknowledge when we talk about that majority affordable, most of the time, it's going to be a nonprofit developer that's, that's largely affordable. Um, so, and then the potential incentives, you know, really are in line with what we heard from developers. So parking reduction, we've got a few numbers there to, to, to kind of talk through potentially. Streamline development approval. One of the things that came up specifically with developers is kind of this, this uh, ability to appeal um, planning board decisions and, and shortening the length of time on that was one way to make a process improvement. That's not necessarily the only uh, thing that we can talk about in that regard, but that was one thing that came up. And then uh, open space uh, potential reductions in open space. Fee rebates, potentially those would apply just to the affordable unit provision, um, expedited uh, rezoning, potentially from non-residential to residential, and then different densities as well. So we don't have to talk through all of those in detail. I'd love to, to jump into discussion um, and, and really um, get your thoughts on and direction on these, these concepts. Uh, but to the extent that we have time to talk through some of the specific incentives um, and values, would be very happy to do that as well. And can I, Corey and I have discussed before, we've got like a two-minute spiel for you guys. So as the Housing Task Force has continued to study this over the last almost year, as we started phasing out of the ULF process, it's, it's become clear to us, and this is true not just in Littleton, but in most places, that there's sort of three buckets, major buckets of housing need and housing development. So there's your 0 to 60% AMI, where there's a... There actually is a thriving community and a pretty well-established framework for how that housing gets built. It's groups like SMHO, it's private LIHTC developers who are basically fee-based developers that just collect a fee to build this housing. They don't make much project profit on the projects themselves. So that, that bucket we want to address by making it really easy on those developers to come to town and say, we want to build a project in Littleton because it's there's a really straight path to doing it. We found a piece of land and we want to do it. And that we think that a successful inclusionary housing policy will include making it really easy on those people. Second bucket is sort of your 60% AMI to 100% AMI. And then your third, and I'll come back to that, but your last bucket is sort of 100% AMI and above. 100% AMI for the most part is met by market rate development. It just private developers that can build profitably to those rents that those people can afford. And so you have this sort of, sometimes it gets called the missing middle. It's actually, that's not what the missing middle means, but this, this in between of 60 to hundred percent, those are firefighters, school teachers, nurses, skilled professionals, oftentimes with college degrees that there isn't a good solution for providing housing for people in that range. And so we also think that an effective and successful inclusionary housing policy will find a way to, to get housing built in that segment. And, and the solution we've come up with is to sort of leverage the momentum and all the capital and expertise and resources behind market rate development to get to build momentum in that area. And that's, that's sort of this tier one and tier two is is that first bucket I talked about, which is the zero to sixty percent. Um, in terms of uh, you know the hundred and plus, I don't think. I mean, there's certainly things we could continue to to address there, but that's what we did with the ULUC. The ULUC was paving the way for a hundred plus percent to get built. This time last year, we didn't have a clear path for that sort of housing to get built, and we're in a much better state today than we than we were last year. So that's how we're thinking about it conceptually um, and just wanted to sort of lay that framework out for you guys. And hopefully by having these three buckets, because a lot of times it seems like our discussions get derailed when we're talking about affordable housing because we don't know what to call it or we're not on the same page. We call it affordable, attainable workforce, low income, you name it. And so these, mm -hmm. by having these three buckets, we hope that will help that issue as well. But, and I think Molly, you did a good job uh, describing what affordable is. It's not just one category. You did a good job. Okay. At, what, at what point do you look at the like the downtown Littleton market and say, unless it's a Geneva village that the city owns, where <laughs> else are you going to buy property and be able to afford it and then build on it to, to make that work? I don't, again, this goes back to the argument I've been telling everybody. 
how does that pencil? I don't, I don't see it pencil um, when, when the property values are so expensive here. So outside, it, it's out, the answer is outside funding sources. So low income housing tax credits, um, mm -hmm. fees to, you know, compliance partners or as they're oftentimes called in this context. So, so the for instance, gets that credit from, <clears throat> from the government or from whoever? Yeah, Corey could do a better job explaining right. LIHTC to me, but LIHTC is basically a federal program that has two tiers, 4% and 9%. The 9% are really competitive. You have to go in for a bid process if you're a developer. And, exactly right, yeah. and you, get, you, you basically get uh, a subsidy to build the project. And so that would be the only way that in a downtown context yep. that a project of an affordable housing project would be but if would the, the land is still X if it's still twenty million dollars for Greg Ranky's property it doesn't pencil. Even with even with your tax credit it doesn't pencil. Well the the project across what is the name of the project that across from uh, the, the, Nevada. Nevada. Nevada Place, Nevada Place Crossing. Too. Little Tube Crossing. Right. That was a lot a nine percent yeah. deal, right? Yeah. So they I know that was five years ago by now or however long, but they they found a way to make a pencil. Across from the courthouse? No, no. It's on Nevada. 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 Yeah. 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 Curtis, Nevada and Barrett. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page that this is not easy. Well, Especially when we're talking about to downtown. Your point though, before the housing went crazy through the roof, we were told that uh, downtown <laughs> you had to have more than three stories. Would not pencil. Yet between 2014 and the next five years, we had what, 26? projects that were three stories with a couple exceptions there was a couple little talking about the townhomes uh, all sorts of properties yeah and so it's sometimes well, that, frustrating that, that stuff pro pencils you know why pencil but they, they keep market saying value. three stories don't pencil no, and I, I, I just said no, i'm not saying you said that doesn't. what i'm saying is people in the past said we can't do it this way because it's not going to pencil and they did it that way because they were able to make thank it you God. and that works great <laughs> <laughs> that's why exactly. who is saying they don't work who is saying they don't work people who are the people uh, when we the were best. going through that uh yeah. uluc process we had to have four stories downstairs we uh, downtown we absolutely have to or they wouldn't pencil yet for years before this sudden increase we had over 26 new properties built over a five-year period that penciled with our old code, which was three stories. So what pencils and what doesn't is if you work within some parameters that you're giving, you'd be surprised what pencils. Yeah, I mean, I think the developer can, can make it, you know, they'll, they get the parameters, they'll say, we can figure it out. You know, it may not be their what their number one choice, but they can, they're not gonna do something if it doesn't pencil. But it also doesn't yeah. have an affordability component. Well, yeah, the, yeah, the ones. Well, and that's, you know, when we're talking about kind of that, the tier one, so that yeah. how can we leverage those market rate developers? We know that, that market rate is going to pencil there because rents and, sure. and housing prices are really high. So when we talk about where do we set this tier one, which would say for a development that's coming in, that's doing market rate downtown, um, a potential inclusionary would now say, okay, but you're building, um, you know, 100 units. We now would like five of those units to be designated affordable. Sure. That would be the set aside. Um, and so how can they offset that? And part Part of that is, uh, you know, sometimes that's just the part of developers going to say, all right, that's part of developing here. And I'm willing to do that because I want I want to develop in this market. Yeah. I mean, the benefit that you have in terms of timing right now is that there's a really strong development market and, that, and that's metro wide. Um, that, that doesn't mean that you're the only municipality with a strong market, right? So you are looking at kind of those trade offs, um, but it is about getting that tier one system right so that when a market rate developer does want to come into downtown and, and we you want them to say, yes, I am willing to do that 5% because it's the cost of doing business and I still want to build in Littleton or, and, or I like the incentive package that you're offering me. You're giving me enough transparency in my approval process that it's worth it. Um, and, and one thing that that is a challenge as we're looking at these and what are those trade-offs between the incentives that we're giving and the set-asides that we're asking is that some, some incentives are really easy to quantify. We can tell you exactly the value of a parking reduction. We can tell you exactly the value of a fee rebate. Can't tell you exactly the value to a developer of an approval process process improvement because it, it doesn't hit the performa in the same way. And so that is a lot of uh, the continued work that we'll do as we get direction from you on what's important as, as the <coughs> as policy, we'll kind of calibrate those numbers. And I think one thing that's important, and I'm sort of jumping ahead to some sub questions, but in thinking about that context, 
is it important to you that the incentives fully offset that affordability requirement or is it okay if they don't necessarily fully offset that requirement? We're willing to ask a little bit of developers and then also give a little bit, or do those have to be perfectly paired? So that's one thing that, um, you know, kind of in the second question, sort of a sub question of the second question of are these set asides and incentives reasonable that we talked through? But that's a critical question um, that, that is, is a policy call um, and is just a choice. Um, so I guess to kind of, uh, kind of pull us back into to some of the questions where we need direction, I mean, the first thing that, that we need to hear from you is whether or not you like the two-tiered system, uh, which I think Eric did a really nice job of explaining kind of why we're coming to that, the philosophy behind that. But um, I, I guess I'm curious to, to get feedback on that first and foremost, and then maybe dive into some more of the details. I'll, I'll start on that. We can work our way down on those. So yeah, I, I'm in favor of the two-tiered system. So go that way. Jerry? Yeah, I like the one-tier, definitely. Did you do one, one tier or the two tiers? Tier. I like the one tier period. Why, Which, Jerry? I, it, I'm really thinking of the middle income folks. Uh, I think the study that, that you guys were a part of at one time, our housing study, it really talked about our middle housing, mm -hmm. the missing middle type thing. We have lots of so-called lower income stuff, uh, products in District 2 and District 1, uh, not so much District 3 or District 4. Uh, what we don't have right now and it has a lot to do with construction. What was it called? The with defects law. Is that what you're thinking of? The defect the law. Yeah, defect thing. law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which really messed up the middle <clears throat> income. And that's yeah. where we really need to have housing is for the middle income. People who have families, they have reasonable jobs that they're teachers, they're nurses, they're police officers, and so on. Um, so I, I'm really focused on middle income. So, you, so you're in favor of yeah. a mandatory one, but not an incentive one for I, I would be willing to consider the discussion, absolutely. <laughs> oh, I'm in full favor of the two-tier system. And I'd be interested to know, are there other um, communities that have this, this system? And if so, you know, what are you hearing or seeing? Mm -hmm. Great question. There are some, I would say a lot of times it's um, informal in terms of the two tiered. So a lot that have, um, and, and this is kind of speaking, we work all over um, the country. And so we certainly see that where there is kind of a, uh, a, a mandatory inclusionary that applies to everybody, but then there's additional either negotiated or sometimes formalized um, additional incentives for low income housing tax credits and that kind of thing. So certainly we see that um, uh, throughout the country. I mean, we can pull in some examples of, of how that's working and, and some of those other things. Uh, I mean, a, an easy sort of neighbor uh, reference is is Denver does that. I mean, they're just getting through their inclusionary. So they used to have an inclusionary on ownership. Now they have it, they're proposing it on rental and owner. They also have additional incentives for affordable housing development. And Kelly, all. This is not that we at all want to become Seattle, but I and my day job work in, on projects in Seattle, and they have mm -hmm. their system is the, the, at least within the city, they have a mandatory you have to build this affordable housing requirement, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, the state of Washington actually has a tax rebate opt-in program that every single developer opts into because it is accretive to their or, or it makes their project pencil more easily. And so there is sort of the bottom, and, and that would be sort of a, we don't have that same tool at our disposal in the state of Colorado because of Tabor stuff, but that's sort of the gold standard that we're almost conceptually modeling this after is you have something that you say, no matter what you do, you have to do this, Mr. Developer, but then you put something else on the table that they go, oh, actually, I want to do that. because I want to build that affordable housing because it's attractive to me. Gotcha. Yeah, I think this this works fine. I think the market will speak, and um, you know, we keep saying downtown. I don't think we're going to downtown per se. Sure. Maybe along the corridors, right? So, yeah, um, yeah this is good. Yeah, I, I like it as well. And um, you know, honestly, I could see the tier one having a little bit more stick than carrot, and I could see tier two being easier to enter. I would, mm -hmm. to, you know, going back to the to the mayor's original question about paying the linkage fees and the fact that we have limited space and availability to even build anything much less affordable. Um, honestly, not giving an out at the bottom level and actually putting pressure on creating units is as important, I think, as well as creating affordable units. So um, yeah, but I like the idea of this tier two system, this two tier system, um, but definitely do want to talk AMI a little bit more because I feel a little 
I guess I feel a little ungrounded in terms of uh, quantities of people we are expecting to mm -hmm. be in certain AMI categories that fulfill that overall 6,500 number mm -hmm. that we are seeking to get to. Like, mm -hmm. you know, are we going to get to the actual number of people? So I feel a little ungrounded in that part of the discussion. So if we could, yeah, but otherwise I'm in favor. I think Jerry brought up a great point about the missing the, the middle. The, and I'm assuming you're thinking 80% here or 100%? Uh, yeah, what it, it, and here it's calling out on this 68, one is 80, 60, 80. 60. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I, I agree just with you. Uh, stuff below, and, and the recommendation was for that too. You know, yeah. Stuff below that we have, I think, enough of that. Template. Yeah, no, I agree too. And I'm just curious as to like the physical number of people that mm -hmm. we are targeting with that either 60 to 100 or 80 to 100 category is. And are we expecting, hopefully, the number of units being built, uh, you know, X percentage of them actually meeting that target AMI. So anyway, I'm, I'm yeah. rather digging to those numbers too. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm more of an advocate of the one tier system and kind of to take a detour a little bit. Um, I'm not, what really scares me is on the second tier, seven story height uh, along corridors, which is high, five story heart in downtown mm -hmm. for multifamily. We're already at 55 feet for four stories. Um, people have to, I think we need to consider the comp plan and character and everybody wants to live here, but if we have all this multifamily housing, we have losing our character. Um, a sense of community, according to the comp plan, is managing our physical environment and keeping the integrity of neighborhoods uh, and keeping that sense of community character I'm reading from the comp plan. And that has to do with the amount of paving, <coughs> open space, uh, and the building types. And basically, in order to get three or four affordable units, we have to have ugly buildings, compromised parking, compromising open space. And that's very frustrating to me that we have to do that. I wish there was another way, um, combined with the fact we're a built out community. So we're just looking at, <coughs> at the corridors and redevelopment. Mm -hmm. uh, I really have heartburn over the duplex and towns homes in the single family areas because that definitely changes the character of the community that that is built in and um i you know i'm not saying we don't want affordable housing definitely we do but we have to be um cognizant of the character of those communities that we're putting it in and make sure it's compatible so one tier for me well said yeah i i disagree on that one i think because of the housing crisis in 2008 in the housing bubble, like we lost a lot of those duplexes and townhomes. And we need those to go places in order to address that missing middle. And I think a natural place for that is in some of those in District 3 and 4 where we have more single families. And I think it can be done still in line with character. I don't think it, I mean, it might not be a single family home, right? It's going to be a duplex or a townhome. But I think it can be done um, in line with that because we just need more of those young families. Um, I want to know if there's a way to incentivize for sale or townhomes. Is there a way to build that into this? There is, and we would suggest that that, um, that the tier one does apply to um, single family and townhome developments. The hard part about it, particularly in a built out community or mostly built out, is that getting the scale at which 5% actually is a unit um, means a pretty big development from a single family and townhome perspective. So. That is to say, it's harder because you're not building uh, to scale on those types of developments given your current constraints. And so I would say, um, yes, this would still apply to those, but it's going to be really hard to actually get those built, uh, at least in terms of actually having a, an income restricted or income restricted <laughs> unit um, within those developments, except for kind of the enhanced incentives that tier two, we're saying to potentially a land trust product, look, we're going to let you as a land trust, um, and, and a land trust is, is kind of like Habitat for Humanity, it, it functions a little bit differently, um, but, but a similar idea in that you can build, uh, you know, a duplex or a townhome that's the same setback um, and, and get some of that, those additional incentives unlocked. So all that to say, um, yes, it would apply to that. It's harder to get the units built because of the scale. 
Okay. And I'd be open to more incentives okay. um, for that option because that is something our community is desperately missing. I mean, to your point, Cherry, I also like it here that we can have like a menu of options for developers. Mm -hmm. I like giving a little bit of freedom in that. Um, the two tier works for me. Um, I don't like pay fee in lieu structure. Okay. I, I just don't like the I, I, We need the research shows that when units are as part of the whole, like that's best for every income level. Um, so I don't want that segregated out or pulled out. Mm -hmm. um, and Steve, to your question, I'm a licensed social worker, right? It means I hold two duly licensed. I'm at the top of my field and I'm at 80% AMI for the new numbers. So if that grounds a little bit of what that kind of level, you know, healthcare worker makes. Yeah. And, and I'll I'll just say real quick there, I have seen municipalities that set a minimum too. So to Molly's comment about um, sometimes the, a 5% of four is a fraction, which gets rounded down to zero. So oftentimes you could say, if you're going to build a fourplex, at least one of those has to be. Yep, you can round up. But, okay. but then at that point you are requiring them to make 25% of their development. Before, it, right? So it's... You have to be sort of eyes wide open about that mm -hmm. that type of. And is there a way to add an, a, you know a trigger incentive in there? Like if by building the minimum one unit, um, you go above a ten percent threshold, there's some other incentive that goes into it. Anything's possible. Yep. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Anything could be built into that. Um, we have also seen uh, communities sort of negotiate deal with that kind of on a case by case and again like transparency and yeah. and process is a priority for developers but there are circumstances where we're gonna have to say look we're gonna have to kind of work through some of that as it goes yeah, so, i mean the yeah. main thing i want to be you know predictable is see everyone sees what what's required of them and how to get through it um, yep so. and there's also a, a, a consideration and this is not just the <clears throat> four unit deals it probably applies up to a hundred unit even is that Compliance is a consideration for, in terms of like literally the paperwork and the ongoing management of income restricted units mm -hmm. can be onerous for certain people. So if you're talking about a small scale developer or even an individual that owns a, a home that they're going to tear down and build a duplex and they have to have one side of that duplex be income restricted, they have to comply federally with the income restricted unit and that can become pretty challenging even for sophisticated developers and management companies mm -hmm. um, not the case necessarily for for sale because the for sale would be complied with separately and just be sort of a deed but um, it, it's another consideration mm -hmm. I mean, so Gretchen sort of I think a few people started diving into the you know the proposed set of sides and incentives it seemed like you know yep. the majority of us were in favor of the the two tier uh, approach um yeah i think the set of sides and incentives that presented uh, you know made sense there wasn't anything that you know rubbed me the wrong way you know the one fear i had is that with the 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 fee in lieu of to you know just I, you know my priority is to build units um, mm -hmm. again, that's big. And so I think that there's a, a risk with that, but I think it needs to be an option at, at some level because mm -hmm. um, money helps as well mm -hmm. in, in other circumstances. Um, so, I mean, the one thing I was, I, one of my questions I sent to staff, and I think you probably answered what I was asking about a kind of a three tier system, if there's a way, and one thing I was thinking, is if there's a way to provide incentive, more incentives on that tier one to say, would someone be willing to go up to, you know, your example in Seattle, to 20%. Because um, there's really no incentive to go from 80% to 20% unless you give them an incentive to do that. So mm -hmm. there's some way to draw. Get that. I see a, a missing middle of that, you know, 20 to 50% of um, set-asides there. For yeah, and I would say it, it's certainly possible. And I think this, this kind of comes back to, uh, I, I guess, some of that of how much do we... How important is, is it for those incentives to fully offset the cost? And so as we're thinking about, generally speaking, incentives are going to help lower a development cost, but an affordable requirement or set aside impacts the long-term operating revenue. Um, and so developers are looking at their exit price potentially, or even if they're a long-term holder of that property, they're looking at 
how much am I getting dinged on my IRR based on this long-term? And like, great, you gave me some development cost savings, but now you're restricting my long-term revenue. And so that's where having a higher affordability set aside gets really complicated and gets a lot more expensive. So it's much harder to incentivize a high set aside um, just because they hit the different parts of the books, right? And, and so getting the math right on that, it's really hard to incentivize anything more than, you know, 15% is about the highest that I ever see in terms of inclusionary, where you're trying to get market rate developers to do it. And that really only happens in really strong markets. Um, so so a 5% to 10% is is more typical when you're looking at a market rate developer. Um, and, and, and as I mentioned, you know, it's just, there just is not a lot that gets done in that kind of mid range just because of the funding sources. It's really hard um, to get returns uh, on a private development um, when you get that high in terms of the set aside just because of what it does to the, the op your operating costs are essentially the same, um, but your operating revenue is constrained. And to just expand real quick, when she talks about funding revenue sources, we talked earlier about Vitech being one of the major ways that this gets built. Litech is most, just to reiterate, is mostly available at 80% and below, mostly 60% and below, and I think 9% deals are only 30. 30, 30, to, 30 to 60. 30 to 60. <laughs> so, so that's really, that. if you're going to finger point at one thing, it's construction costs. On the one hand is why market rate developers could never imagine building something down at 60% AMI, and Litech funding rules are why people like Corey could never imagine building up at 80% because there's no funding available for that. And, and to your point, <laughs> that when we're talking about a market-based system uh, or, or kind of one that's an incentive only, so if we set the mandatory at the lower threshold, there's no reason we can't have another suite of incentives in that stack to that's say, if you're doing this, and the reality is that, that the market will tell you if that's going to work or not. Um, it, it may not work, My guess is that the market is not going to provide a lot in there, but it doesn't cost you more to have that additional program. And if you get one or two developers to say, yeah, I'm in, um, then and, and certainly having it as an available option will, <coughs> um, will demonstrate flexibility. It will also you know, at least allow you to test the waters to see if anybody takes it, right? And so there's no harm in doing it, particularly if you're not making that that step up mandatory. I just want to be careful about not recreating a, a difficult to navigate system right. for, for yeah. people yeah. that also are like, point. wow, we've got 18 different options. I don't even know where to start. Yeah. yeah. Well, as far as the uh, incentives mentioned, I don't. There's nothing off the table. I know uh, Councilmember Grove mentioned the height, but I mean, seven stories already allowed in, in quarter mixed use. So I don't I mean I don't know why we're having heartburn about that. That was that's that's the law of the land. So and quite honestly, I mean, I still think that we have such a great advantage here, a great opportunity here around our light rail stations to have more dense um, development. Like and Aspen Grove. Aspen Grove and downtown. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Any of those areas <clears throat> for any kind of, to, to really encourage people to start, you know. Well, and that's where the development's going to go. It's going to be like yeah. Enzer. That's, that's really about what we have left, that combine. Dorgrins. Well, unless Jeff. you exclude duplexes and, and just increasing general density. Well, I'm talking about the yeah. big, big pieces of land. Big pieces of land, yeah. yeah. I, have a, I have a one more question. Yeah. Go ahead. This might actually be for Reed. Could this Zero, happen? zero. <laughs> <laughs> Could this housing ordinance be retroactive or once it's once if we decide to, to pass it, is it for any development going forward? When I say retroactive, like sure. uh, it would depend on, on how far along in the process they are in terms of one, whether they've vested their rights at either state or local law or even at common law, there's arguments that if someone has expended, you know, a ton of money in the architectural process and they're that far along, but they technically have not pulled a building permit that that could be considered vested. So, you know, there's a lot of PDs now that call for residential that have never been built. So, yes, it could be done retroactively to those locations. And when you say retroactive, I'm thinking, I mean, anything that's built in the future, you're not going to go back to something that was built 10 years no, ago. No, 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 no. no. I, I understood the question. I know. I was, I was just clarifying. Yeah. I know you did. Which is kind of sad. That's kind of what it sounded like. Sounds like something Seattle would do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, want, just want to clarify that. Yeah. that it's, it's retroactive yeah. to 1965. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thing after it can control. apply to existing approved PDs that have not been built yet. Okay. Yes. Or 
PLOs or whatever we're calling it today. Mm -hmm. and, uh, before we go around, the one other thing that uh, Gretchen said is, you know, I, I'm you know, big on trying to incentivize and get that uh, that general density of the, the duplexes. I, I don't think that they would, you know, duplexes, triplexes, diminish the character of a neighborhood at all. I think actually I think they add to it. So I think that there's a way to, to incentivize that or require that. Get that. I won't steal Molly's thunder on that point, but um, I'll remind everybody that we have those in our neighborhoods already. Yeah. There are duplexes okay. and townhomes all throughout our neighborhoods already, and they already blend in. Um, the really hard policy question on missing middle stuff is things like setbacks and lot minimums. I mean, right now, I always use the example of my single family home on Gallup. I can't, I couldn't build two homes on my quarter acre lot. Um, so that's a really a ULEP question. It, it can dovetail with the IHO, but in terms of trying to incentivize that sort of housing, there it's a different approach to, to what you want your city to look like. Do you want every single person to have a quarter acre lot? I think we've already addressed that in our yeah. role. Yeah. And, and we covered all the different options of uh, short-term rentals and and uh, dupla or uh, conversions above garage and stuff like that. So I think yeah. that's already... Well, I think he's asking, do we have the opportunity to allow people, not everyone wants a quarter acre lot, is there an opportunity to say, hey, if you, uh, uh, we'll give you the option to build a, a duplex and so it's, an, you know, have an eighth of an acre, so it's not necessarily a requirement, so. And it's, and that in, in terms of the inclusionary housing ordinance scope, right. it's a question of, is that something that's on the table to say, hey, if you're going to build three row homes on what was formerly a large single family home lot, for instance, that normally wouldn't be allowed under the ULAC, but because you're providing the pl public good of affordable housing, one of those three units, for instance, is in for sale at 80% AMI, you can build three units there. And, and that's and that's kind of getting to yep. what you, yeah, exactly. I think that that is where that kind of middle tier yeah. that you were talking about comes in, is because you're talking about the scale of three units, four units, five units, if you're in that, then we give you substantial concessions related to lot size setback. Um, uh, you know, potentially other things as well. But that is a really important question. Um, that is what would make uh, an inclusionary work for for sale. And if we're if if the council is not willing to offer incentives in single family neighborhoods or um, traditionally single family look at you know kind of contexts um, that are related to lot size or lot width, then there's there's not a lot else that we can offer. You know, a lot of the incentives that we talk about, parking and um, height and density, those typically just apply to multifamily, right? And so when we're talking about the, the lower density products and the traditional for sale products, um, it, it's going to have to be related to lot size um, width um, and, and context um, there. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have it look the same, be, be the same context. You know, it's not like we're saying you can build um, slot homes in every neighborhood, uh, but uh, but that that is an important, you know, component of a successful IHO that would apply to for sale and provide that missing metal. Yeah. Uh, not missing metal. That's, that's something. Yeah, you know, something I would like to see. I think I, it's not going to take over neighborhoods. You're not going to have every single house be redeveloped into a triplex or a duplex. I think it would be here, here or there. You know, kind of like with ADUs. Mm -hmm. um, so, all right, should we go around? And but there are neighborhoods that have done that. I mean, scraped every blocks for blocks around. And if you're familiar with the Oriental. Uh, uh, theater over there, 44th and uh, Tennyson, I think it is. Yeah. Literally, block after block, scraped, and they put up duplexes. That, that's all that, market that rate. That sell for, yeah, 900. Yeah. Uh, that's what I was saying. We're not allowed in the We're not allowed in the market. Yeah, so it can happen in neighborhoods where whole neighborhoods get bought out and scraped. Yeah, I'm, yes. not, I'm not really interested in destroying our neighborhoods like that. I think that is destroying our neighborhoods. Back to Pam's point, it's, it's, it's taking away the so, character. You can, you can say all you want. But you're going to have extra parking that you're going to need. You're going to have it's it just it's just too much for the neighbors. I know it can't happen in, for example, my neighborhood because we're an HOA and it won't happen. But I I would hate to see some of these older communities uh, that have this these beautiful lots that back up to a lake over here that all of a sudden there's four units or five units on that. It just to me isn't isn't worth it. It's and and what real quick just because I know duplexes oftentimes come up or row homes oftentimes come up to reiterate my point there's 
if you're interested in looking at incentives here, lot size minimums is a, a real thing. So like think about, I'm going to forget the name of it, but east of Buck Rec Center <clears throat> or Spotswood near Stern Park, those all are smaller lots, still very attractive homes. In fact, probably some of the most valuable homes within the city of Middleton on a per square footage basis. And those would not, you cannot build those in our neighborhoods today. You can build anything that looks like them. Most of the lots downtown would not be in compliance with certain lot size minimums in, in certain districts within uh, the city. So, so again, if it's, I talked about construction costs earlier, part of the equation on providing a missing middle solution to people is providing less square footage. My home is 1,200 square feet with no basement. That was built in 1954. Nobody builds that anymore because the, does, the economics don't work. And one of the reasons the economics don't work is because land prices have gone up in the last seven years. And so if you could, you could, somebody could still potentially find a way to build a 1,200 square foot home if they didn't have to buy a quarter acre lot to do so. So, and that is, I mean, I think to that point, you know, Middleton has such a variety of those neighborhoods. That is something that we could look at as we're calibrating what these potentials could be is to say, look, here are neighborhoods in which there are existing um, kind of gentle density or smaller lots. What, um, where can you actually build that lot size elsewhere in Littleton? And so we don't necessarily have to say there's no there's no lot size requirement. We can say, look, this is um, we're catering to kind of one of the the smaller typical lot size, um, you know, in older districts and that sort of thing. So we can look within the city for some of those boundaries, even if we're still making an incentive. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I think to Pat's point, we this decision on the like the baseline zoning has already been made with the ULUC. This is really about if you're if we've we've decided what we want on a baseline U luck for the neighborhoods, but if you're willing to provide the additional public good of for sale affordable housing, maybe we will sort of give you a leg up in the development process and make it actually feasible for you to do so. Yeah, and, and then we, we talked about that. You know, encourage that in the comprehensive plan as well. So yeah. Um, to get back to the kind of higher level with the incentives and set asides, did you have anything else, Kelly? Did you want to? Is there anything that no, was I, off the I table? Agree. Or you... Incentives. Um, I, I think about even in District Four, you know, which is mostly made up of neighborhoods. At the corner of Prince and Ridge, there are townhomes and apartments. They've been there, and that hasn't that didn't change the the, the look and feel of that of that you know that part of the city. So. There was I, nothing there when they were built, though. Maybe not, but there's, it's you know, there's a <laughs> spot across the street. Maybe it took away from the open space. space. <laughs> <laughs> it took away from the open space. <laughs> so it's not like I, I don't agree that all of a sudden you know people are just going to tear down their houses I don't think and so throw up duplexes it and all that. But exactly. I want to come back to community character because I keep hearing that coming up, and I'm pulling this right out of the Envision plan, and it says. The small town feel and community can mean different things to different people. And they remain abstract concept, concepts unless clarified based on lengthier survey comments, focus groups, community coffee chats, and in-depth discussions at community events. The small town, fe small town feel and community feel that exists in Littleton and is highly valued stems from the following. And one is complete community, active in daytime, stable population, which doesn't mean no growth gathering places, community events, quality schools. That's our character. But it means something different to each one of us. So we, you know, we value diversity, inclusion. That was loud and clear, you know, in the comp plan. Creating housing, up, house, a diverse housing stock, I think, is vitally important to the survival of this community going and, forward. And Littleton does have a very diverse housing stock. So I like the... Some people would disagree. Some right. people say we, we, we have more than most cities our size, way more than most cities our size. So um, just be cautious, I guess. Steve? Yeah, I would say like uh, some of the incentive structures like <coughs> make sense and some of them I think still need to be explored. Uh, to be honest, I actually kind of agree with the height restrictions for the multifamily developments downtown. Quite honestly, it doesn't get us to the numbers that we need, but it takes away more from 
the look and feel that I think a lot of folks treasure. I would rather see our efforts put more towards seeing what we can do about lot sizes and the large and estate sized lots uh, to just even reduce lot sizes, um, not even necess necessarily designate, you know, provide incentives for duplexes, but every step along the way, looking at what is reduction lot size, what does a duplex look like, and where does a triplex get us in terms of the actual market affordability of those units. Um, the, but I think that's, to me, that's more the key. With regards to the rest of the tier two options, I mean, there's gonna be for 100 unit more properties, there's only what, we can count them on one hand, like five left to be done of that kind of size and scale. So I guess I'm kind of, I have a sense of urgency about getting some kind of hard and fast numbers with regards to, um, you know, AMIs as well as percentage of those units becoming affordable. I think that's a high priority because quite honestly, there are, those projects are on deck to be built. And I don't want to miss the opportunity for a thousand unit development to miss out on even a hundred or well, I guess less if it's 8%, so 80, uh, you know, of those units becoming affordable. Um, so I would say priority wise, that's where a huge priority is. And then the question about how we achieve and what does that <laughs> density look like? It's a longer conversation because that will get built out and bought up very slowly. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of tweak and refine that as we go. But I think we need to start somewhere. <laughs> I agree with what you said about downtown. Um, we spent a lot of time on the ULIC. We hashed through that and came up with this four story, 55 feet, which at 10 feet a story, that's, is that really, um, how many stories really is that? Um, I think that changes the character. I think um, we don't wanna do that. I also agree with what you say. If we are going to have these new developments, Enzor, um, possibly over at Littleton Village that we have some kind of ordinance so that we don't miss yes. out on that opportunity. Um, I would like to advocate for single family homes. Um, according to the uh, comp plan, um, one of the key characteristics of uh, characters, paving, open space, and what the building looks like. And if you start cutting it off and going lot line to lot line, then all of a sudden that changes the character and that changes the appeal. And I don't think single family homes are our enemy. Um, I know prices have gone up. We're in a very strange time, but it's not unique to Littleton. It's throughout the country as people are moving around and houses are being bought up. And we hear the stories of how people are spending um, cash over buying price. Uh, but I don't think changing, the, allowing those communities to change and put duplexes in and uh, cutting down on open space, I don't think that's the answer to our character, to our appeal, to our community. And that um, the corridors are um, maybe where that housing belongs. I don't know if you know, but um, we, uh, council approved uh, 2,000 units in Aspen Grove and during um, COVID, during the holidays, in 21 days, they got over 3,500 signatures to overturn that. Now, considering we have about 10,000 people that vote, that's about a third of our voters. We have many more people that live here. So there is a group of very interested voters that don't necessarily want high density um, and high buildings everywhere. And they're a very active group. And I think we have to be aware of them and note that not everybody wants these high densities, high buildings everywhere. And that um, limiting them and doing them within reason and having kind of a moderate approach is something that I think maybe we should consider and advocate or these voters in the community are gonna make their voices heard. Can I ask you just a clarifying question? Um, so I hear you saying you uh, prefer the, a single family detached to the kind of duplex or townhome option. But what I wasn't sure about is, are you um, in favor of incentives for affordable that would reduce lot size if it is just for a single family 
unit. So, so when we're talking about lot size reductions, I get, we're kind of conflating that with also like, okay, duplexes need a smaller lot size. Um, but if you think about uh, like a fully affordable development, like a habitat or something like that, would you be in favor of incentives that allow that type of development to have smaller lot sizes? And that um, would be not. like it for new development. For new development. Yep. I don't know. Let me give that some Okay, thought. that's totally fine. I just want to make sure I didn't miss um, what you Yeah, I'm mainly okay. against the, the downtown like we were talking. Okay. And um, I, just, I just have a sense that we think that single family neighborhoods are bad. I don't think anyone's saying single family neighborhoods are bad. No. I, I think we just got a lot of them. Yeah, we got a lot of them. I think I think I don't think duplexes are bad. I don't think apartments are bad. I think all housing is good. I think that's the kind of the thing is I think some people are saying some housing isn't good. That's what we, it sounds like to me. Yeah, I think that the way that the illustration that's always helped me uh, is like the the resiliency of a cornfield versus the resiliency of a rainforest. This is a, a famous sort of illustration on this topic. A cornfield is all one crop. If a pest comes or a plague or some sort of herbicide comes to that cornfield, it, mortgage crisis? it will, <laughs> Just it will example. wipe out the entire field. It's one species of plant that is susceptible to the same diseases, etc. In a rainforest, if a pest comes that targets, I don't know, some sort of palm tree or something, I'm not a, I don't know that much about plants, but um, it will kill all of those palm trees and all of the other plants will continue to thrive, right? And so it, creating resiliency in neighborhoods with a diversity of housing stock means that when we go through a crazy housing time like this, we still have a place for those teachers whose salaries haven't yet gone up to match with the rising cost of housing to live because there's options embedded. So I don't think that lot size minimums are at all at odds with the single family home ideal. I love living in a single family home. I love having a yard. I think probably ever, most everybody in this room lives in a single family home. And so we're, we don't hate them, but the, the um, you know, it get, it's, a, it's a question of, do you have a, a ranch with a 50 foot lot line or do you have a bungalow with a 25 foot lot line that still has a backyard that still has windows on all sides and a separate, you know, side yard and fence and everything. And right now you can't build that bungalow in most places in Wilmington. Well, you could build it. It would just be surrounded by like 30 feet of grass on every side. So that's, I think it's really just about providing more diversity within that, not going after any one single thing and saying we want all apartments or we don't want any single family homes. Yeah. Well, and we've talked a lot about a missing middle. One of the uh, groups we haven't mentioned is seniors, for lack of a better term, who don't want stairs mm -hmm. and it's more conducive to um, a one floor type unit. And that is not cost effective, and that's why we're not seeing a lot of them. And many seniors are not being able to age in place in Littleton who want maybe something where they don't have a lot of um, land, but they don't want these tall, skinny things or multi levels because, it, because it's not good for people having knee problems or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I just throw that out. We've been talking about teachers and nurses or whoever, um, but also that senior group too. And that's, you know, some of those people fall within those mm -hmm. lower sure. AMIs mm -hmm. that are on fixed income and need to be addressed. And their needs are in some ways similar, but in some ways different mm -hmm. because of the single floor. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also talked about the, the cottage, right? The cottage. Um, ADU. ADU. Well, ADUs for oh, one. Oh, cottage courts. Cottage courts, yeah. yeah. I mean, you may take a piece of land and put what, four to six to eight homes? Well, like patio homes. Almost like patio you know, homes. Yeah. Yeah. Even smaller. Yeah. Like almost make like a little community. But that's going to be, mm -hmm. like, you know, that's a, a change. All the seniors that have the mobility issues typically do live on the, mm -hmm. on the floors, and the young spry people tend to move upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and their first Pam, to, to <laughs> Then they regret on. that they ever did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the people in my neighborhood with the multi-stories uh, all have to move to Aurora. Because to get one story. Yeah. Well, and so the, the other, the knock-on effect of that is the more options you provide, a smaller single-family home, for instance, that's a single level, or an ADU, or a cottage court, the, 
those people who have retired and their kids have are long since gone can move out of their oversized home and open that up for a family that just there are no opportunities for them to buy that home. So to sort of help regenerate the life cycle of housing is also another virtue of creating all these different options. So that yeah, it's having, having those options is, you know, I think we're going at how many, yeah, and I don't, in our neighborhood, people are sticking. Right. It's amazing. I was going to say, it's amazing how many people like you know, Aberdeen village helped me when I was knocking on doors, how many 95, hundred year old, you know, people are living by themselves in a 4,000 square foot house on a half acre. Very few. Very well, <laughs> <laughs> more than should be. <laughs> Says the younger person, just like the next generation in Aspen suggested that the older people need to move out of their homes so that younger people can move in. That's what you're suggesting. I'm not kicking anyone out and, of their and house. And seniors saying, don't all, options for Not all seniors want to move. They like having their houses. It's where they raise their families. Yeah. A day comes when they maybe get carted out first. Feet first. <laughs> but not all seniors want to move. I, I never said all of them want to move. I just said have the options. Nor did I say you did. You just did. Um, anyways, Gretchen, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'm a renter here. I would love to be able to buy a little tin. I'm a single income family at 80% AMI, and that's after my company adjusted. I gave some adjusted rates and raises to folks to match inflation. So, like, we just need to increase more stock and more options for those in that 50 to 80% AMI. So, for me, all those incentives I think are on the table because we need to prioritize making those properties available my perspective I agree and you don't have like there, there aren't like condos for you to really get into anymore right? you know nope. we stopped building and that's what's missing and that's part of that 2008 right that's that housing bubble that has contributed to that that's some of the state laws well, that have contributed to this so exactly. if we can state laws that are, yeah well if we can incentivize purchasing and having for sale I know we can't legislate that with yeah. development but if we could incentivize that like let's you know create that market again for it because it's there um, and we want those folks here, and we want the ones with young families here too. We heard that in LPS, you know, uh, last week at that breakfast. Like, we need more more kiddos. Um, They've been saying that for a couple of decades now. <laughs> so for just, yeah. I don't know if I misheard, but for for sale, we've always had the ability to require a certain amount of a new development coming in to be at some sort of rate. It's the rental where we've had issues up until last year. That passed. Say more about that. What do you mean? Like, so as a as a development coming in, if it's if it was going to be at for sale property, we always had the ability. The city had the ability to require a developer if we had a policy in place to uh, require a certain amount of those homes coming into a neighborhood to be at market or whatever that number was. We had that ability. Mm -hmm. so through this never, or through something else that no, just hasn't been. Well, what we what recently what we've been talking about most homes that are coming in most of what we're talking about is multifamily. And is we're talking about rents and rentals type yeah. things coming in. We've never had the ability to actually control rents, if you will, or mm -hmm. control some level of affordability with those um, until last year when we passed a new state law that says that we have the ability to do it, provided that we're providing some sort of incentives or different abilities for a developer to meet those requirements. We have to have different alternatives for a developer to actually come in and to be able to do it so and and that is where that fee and lieu comes in which which we've talked about and i'll just ask this this one follow-up question i know where um i'm taking up a lot of your time tonight so i will stop talking but um as we look at uh, a fee and lieu option um as uh your city attorney clearly laid out um it, part of the state law around the ability of communities to have an inclusionary housing ordinance is that there there is this little carve out for but you have to give developers options the easiest way to get developers compliance options is a fee and lieu. Um, but what's so, so I would say fee and lieu is, is most likely gonna have to stay on, on the table as an option. However, you can set a really high fee and lieu, you can set a really low fee and lieu. And that, you know, we've kind of hinted, a couple of folks have kind of hinted around that. Like I'd really like to incentivize unit production over fee collection. Um, it, it's likely, you know, we can't perfectly streamline it so that everybody does one thing or the other, but we can talk about, and we're continuing to talk about with the housing task force, where should we set that fee? How do we think about that? There's a couple of really standard methodologies for calculating kind of the maximum uh, fee that's typical. Um, 
it can be all the way up to the actual cost of building an entire unit. Um, there's there's some places that set it there. When you set it there, no one pays the fee. Um, when you set it lower, everyone pays the fee. So that's something to continue thinking about. Um, we don't necessarily have to talk about it tonight. Uh, I understand you will probably need to move on, but that's another element of thinking about the options and compliance is whether we want to incentivize unit production or incentivize the fee um, through, through the structure um, and basically where we set the fee. Do you want to, let's see, we went through the first one there. Do you want to hint on the offset? Is that something that we need to? I think we all agreed on those. Well, except for Jerry, we're all yes. So the other one is if no. Right, the next slide. Yeah, the next slide is the, is the if no. I think we've kind of talked through these. So I think we can kind of gloss over that. We, we didn't talk in great detail about whether those incentives fully offset the cost. Um, you know, and, and that's not something that we have to have perfect direction on tonight. So I, I do want to assure you that you've given us lots of really helpful direction on taking next steps in terms of really calibrating kind of the feasibility and the offsets around, uh, you know, where should we think about these set asides? What's on the table? What's not on the table? Um, you know, we'll continue to calibrate some of those numbers. Um, the extent to which you have time and, and want to talk about the, the full offset or not, that helps us, um, you know, because uh, if, if we have clear direction on that, then that, that narrows down what we um, kind of focus on in terms of looking at feasibility um, or even if, if we want to have a brief conversation about it, but I also want to be sensitive to The incentive time. covers the cost of adding that is basically, I mean, I would like it to be as close to full as possible, but maybe not. It doesn't have, you know, if it's slightly off, that's fine with me. We'll go this way. Gretchen. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the, the one, we've talked about this amongst ourselves, and one of the challenges is um, we, we did a really good job with the ULUC, and there's not a ton of meat left on the bone in terms of incentives to, to put in front of developers. So they're not going to go above seven stories, even if we told them they could go to 100, because the revenue that they could generate from those projects would in Littleton just would not justify the construction costs. So, you know, some of the sort of nibbling around the edge of the cookies type things are Right now, we say you can build 85 units per acre. Well, if you're an affordable developer and you want to build 120 units per acre because they're all smaller studios or something like that, would we want to? That's an incentive we could potentially offer, but some of the really juicy ones just aren't on the table anymore because we did a good job with the UX. So, bad stuff on the back. <laughs> Which is a good thing. I mean, we, yeah. we certainly hear communities talking about we don't want to hold good zoning hostage to inclusionary. Um, and so that's really good. But it also, it, it does mean it, it might be really hard for us to get to a full offset in terms of quantifiable costs. Um, and then that pushes us more toward are there process improvements we can continue to make? Um, and where are some of these other, you know, we may get into some some harder questions for you around, you know, what are you willing to do in order to fully offset that? Uh, because when we, if we think about it, uh, if, if we're not at a full offset right now, then the, the two options are to lower the affordability requirements or increase the incentives. And, and so that just, that pushes us into some harder conversations most likely, uh, but it's still helpful to have a gauge of, of how close we need to try and get. I guess I'm not clear. What are you recommending? That we we have a, a set aside almost equal to the price of a new unit so that it's just just underneath? Well, so this is, we're actually, I think we sort of pivoted from talking about where the fee is to just in terms of if you're going to produce the affordable housing, how much is it costing developers on their pro forma to actually have that rent constrained unit? And do the incentives that we're saying we're offering, like, a parking reduction or a fee rebate, is that, uh, do we want those incentives to be big enough to fully offset um, their cost? So it's net neutral to the developer. Um, is that important or is that not important? And, and I would say most inclusionary programs are not net neutral. Most of them are a little bit of pain <laughs> to the developer in terms of, of kind of the ask. It, it's just really hard to get those perfectly balanced. But that said, it helps guide us in what incentives to look at to know if you if if having a full offset, having a net neutral program to a developer is really important. Then we will dig a lot deeper on trying to recommend and and at least showcase to you incentives that might help um, balance that scale a little bit more. Or, or now we're not coming in with a you know there are certainly communities that have come in and said look. 
you just do this now. We're not giving you anything. This is like, we just, this is now our new policy. And, and that's, that is not uncommon either. So you're already in the middle of, of where, you know, just based on how we're approaching this, um, you're not on the extreme end of penalizing developers. Um, but, uh, but we kind of want to know where on the spectrum of that do you want to be? I guess I'm a little bit different. Um, everybody needs to make it worthwhile for them to build something. Mm -hmm. But I just get so frustrated that we have to give up open space and parking mm -hmm. and uh, unit size and so much. So I would like, I, I'm more on the pain side. <laughs> sure. I would like to be able to, to get some affordable yeah. units without Without giving away everything. Thank you. Yep. And that is, uh, you know, we talked about it briefly too. We can also structure this as a menu of options. So we can list six things, but they only get to pick three. And that also helps you with an initial program figure out what incentives are working and what incentives are working. Because in two years, if no one has taken these three incentives, you know, those are not useful. So, so and, and the thing, one thing I'll just say about the pain thing, Molly and I have talked about this. It's, it's sort of inevitable given the the incentives that we have at our disposal in Littleton. Um, just remember that Littleton is one municipality surrounded by other municipalities. And the two, as if we are serious about wanting housing stock creation within our community, if at some point, if we make it too painful, they'll just go build in South Jefferson County, find a site in Highlands Ranch, Inglewood, Centennial, right? So if we do really want this housing to be in our community, like we've always said, we, we don't want to stick our elbows out too wide. If it helps those, all three of those jurisdictions are also my clients. So if you want to... <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we coordinate on <laughs> Can we make it slightly more painful? <laughs> Hold on, let me talk to Inglewood tomorrow. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, truly, like yeah. that, I think that's, that's the goal. Is like it is a slightly painful it's process, but I think there are enough developers out there at this point looking to build and anything that we, you know, even if we cut down the number of developers by fifty percent, that would become knocking on our door for these projects. We still have another 50% of developers that would be happy to abide by those new regulations. So I'm fine if it is not a net neutral okay. policy. I do want to say too, in terms of the incentives structures, with the ULUC just being passed and administrative approvals in that process yep. being more codified, and I actually appreciate the amount of time and detail and attention that was put into that, I wouldn't be in favor of changing that or accelerating yep. that at this point. I mean, but I would say like it's, it's obviously worth considering in the future if we find that that is the sticking point, mm -hmm. but to let that administrative process ride for now and not push it faster necessarily. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't know if that's going to be like the, the big bang cost savings that is going to really drive the market anyway. So I would say, I, I don't want to say take it off the table, but I'm less inclined to change that part of our ULUC at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll just see how that public engagement process turns out, how the, the approval process looks, and see what that, response we get back. Does that um, comment apply to this second tier of majority affordable as well? Because that, to- That's tough, that's a tough question, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it's, it's an important conversation because as Molly mentioned, when she talked to the development community, like universal re response was, we need more transparency to get to from the start line to the finish line. Yes. And I know you're you're basically saying that you luck we've done that and we just don't want to tamper with that too much before we've figured out how that works. And I think the question is for certain affordable developers, would we want to even supercharge that more? I, again, I would be less inclined, I would be more inclined to give up other components okay. and put other incentives in front of folks rather than tamper with that because again, it's such a temperamental process and again, we don't quite yet know where people are going to land on that and I think you know there's enough public engagement especially like the public engagement and the approval processes that are included in there I think we just need to see how that plays out so fast tracking it you know beyond that right now probably it seems um I don't know, part a bit of cart before the horse I feel like we've got other more tangible things we can offer anyway so yeah and maybe if we can as we study it further, if we identify really specific pain points in that process for people, we can yeah. come back to you with those two. Okay. 
I'm right along, Steve. I think it needs to be a little bit painful, but uh, let's not make it a deterrent from actually doing what we need them to do. Yeah, yeah two-tier incentives. I would be a little bit more in favor of fast tracking it a little bit faster, especially for affordable. Um, but I defer to the group then as well. If there, if we go along the process and we see that there are major sticking points, and we'll come back and talk about it. But I'm right here on the side of of, of making it, moving it. Yeah. I, right now, I'm leaning on uh, fully offset. And the reason is because I don't know how much it's going to cost City of Littleton. We're saying, oh yeah, let's just have these incentives. Uh, we have no idea. We're, we're sitting there giving away other people's money, the taxpayers. We, we don't have an estimate on what it will cost over time. We're not giving away the money. It's saying, oh, you fully offset. We'll let them go higher or let them have less setbacks. Is the right? So you're that, in my mind, we're still revenue. forcing someone to do something. Um, but and I presume you could come up with some sort of wild guess on, mm -hmm. or not right now, of course. I mean, I mean, like, <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, for instance, we, as you know, we we kicked around thirty-five, so over sixty-five hundred units over time, ten years, whatever it is. So it, using that as a number, whether it's a good number or not, you know, what kind of incentives, what would it, something, it is going to cost the city. There, nothing goes at a zero cost. So what is, what would it cost? Okay, so uh, yes, city manager. Do you mind if I just make a couple of comments and suggestions here? I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think... Um, when this comes back to the council, I think maybe showing some actual examples of what duplexes and triplexes could look like. You know, for example, the neighborhood I live in, which is, you know, in Arvada, um, their duplexes, I could never. And you have a house for sale, go out on the market tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and even if I sell that house, I couldn't buy the duplex that's up the street from me. Yeah. I mean, they, the market has just changed when it comes to that. So I think some actual examples of how the ULUC would actually utilize our new code and shape those kinds of housing units. I think physically seeing some drawings of what that could look like. The other thing I would say is that, you know, certainly in my discussion, I've been here through the whole comp plan and ULUC. Um, I never envisioned that we'd be putting duplexes, at least in our first try, right in the middle of our single family residential areas. I had always envisioned that with the hard work was trying to find some areas where it would be acceptable to our community. Around the transitional areas that are more obvious, maybe practical, and that we would spend our time there looking for opportunities to try to build this kind of missing middle, so to speak. I think too, the when we talk about mixed use in the corridors, you know, I think there's this concern that somehow it's going to be this wall of, you know, multi-story. I think, practically speaking, you'll never see that. Um, I worked in the Seattle area as well, and a community that was very aggressive about affordable housing, and they did all sorts of things. And in their 20 years, they never saw anything like that. So I know that our challenge is going to be trying to find the projects that make sense for our community. And quite honestly, I think the economic development strategy coupled with this is going to highlight some examples that I think we'll start to build around that. So the mixed use in the corridors, I think that is, while the zoning may allow it, you're just not going to see it in 20, 30 years. It's just not going to happen that way. I'm confident of that. And so I think it's, it's one of those where bringing examples and being vested into this issue here financially, I think beyond just these incentives, if you really want to make a change here, it's beyond just this housing ordinance, my opinion. Well, and speaking of, oh, no, I was going to say there are, there's an example of a, um, a couple of houses in downtown, in the downtown neighborhood. They look like houses, but they're duplexes, and they're so cute, adorable. Yeah, very expensive. Very expensive. I, I take photos every time I see one, so I'll bring photos next time we meet. It's I think it helps because, you know, I think a lot of people, when we use the word duplex, they, they like you know, certainly in my this. lifetime, I can remember living in a few that were questionable, but um, <laughs> I think today it's just different here. And uh, the marketplace has changed a duplex to something much more than I could ever afford. And I think, and I think to your point about affordability, and I think um, either Pat or Jerry made it earlier too, a lot of times when these get built in a context like Tennyson Street in Northwest Denver, they are million dollars. And so that's where we, just saying 
let's let people build duplexes is it's not that doesn't necessarily provide affordable housing. So right. coupling it with well, for somebody, maybe. yeah, <laughs> right. affordable to certain people, and and so coupling it with certain requirements saying, hey, you can only build a duplex in these areas if right. half of it is at 80% AMI or whatever. So like those, yeah, those so that, that, that neighborhood I was talking about, uh, Eric, uh, over by the Oriental Theater, um, it totally revitalized that area. Yeah. I mean, it was very run down, that, that entire area. And now it is boom. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, if you had a certain percentage that had to be uh, restricted somehow, that yeah, would make sense. Okay. So we appreciate the direction. What we like to uh, list all the directions you're taking away from us. Yeah, do you want to go down? Yeah, yeah just gonna... yeah. I can I can give kind of a. Yeah, can I scan the page? I think. Yeah. I mean, very broadly speaking, what what I'm hearing and taking away, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's there's general favorability toward a two-tiered system where we have some minimal mandatory requirements. Um, we're, we're sort of hearing that in terms of the incentives for those mandatory requirements, it's okay if they're a little bit painful for developers, uh, mostly, but we do want to make sure that we're, we're trying to make it not terribly painful. We don't want to chase folks to other jurisdictions, um, but it may not have to be a full offset. Um, so that's kind of the direction I'm hearing, including uh, kind of clearing the path, clearing the path as much as we can for um, majority affordable development. So I guess question one, we're taking that as a general yes um, on the if yes, do they do the set asides and incentives seem reasonable? We're hearing for the most part, yes, that seems reasonable with a couple of exceptions around caveats uh, for you know what what would that really look like in terms of form um, and uh, and making sure that we're calibrating that, really digging into what's some of those particular costs are in terms of the process oriented improvements uh what what i'm kind of taking away is uh, yes there might be room there but we don't want to mess with the administrative stuff we've done in the ulux so let's let's talk about whether there might be specific pain points um or, or specific ways that, that we can think about it and, and again all of kind of the incentives and proposed set asides we'll come back to you again with um so that we can talk through that's that's really the heavy lift next is to be working uh particularly with the housing task force on on really honing in on those so i guess i'm getting a broad yes on question one uh uh yes ish on on uh, number two um with some of the nuance that we've talked about uh related to specific neighborhoods um but but hearing that yes we we do want this to apply um, to both rental and owner, and that there may be some middle tier that we haven't quite talked about, particularly as we talk about some of those gentle density forms uh, like um, triplex townhomes. Uh, certainly not taking anything conclusive about where those should be, because um, I'm not hearing consensus on that, uh, but hearing that we should look at that as an option if it's got an affordability requirement, uh, but may take a little bit more work to figure out where those go. And, and then you have to, that, yeah, and the fair? plan is to yeah. come back and July, so yeah, I'm just going to talk about next steps because the other thing that I would say is, you know, we, we hear the urgency mm -hmm. and that's been expressed this evening. But what we'd like to ask is for the opportunity to go back and do the very detailed work with the housing task force and then present again in a study session where we think the nuts and bolts and and specific incentives where we think the targets make sense. Have an opportunity to also work with Molly on a market sort of feasibility mm -hmm. um, and understand how those market forces work. And we understand that we don't want to create too much disruption. I think that's also a theme that we've heard this evening. So we would come back on August mm -hmm. 6th. And then if council is interested in moving forward with an ordinance, we have it tentatively scheduled on your calendar for first reading on September 20th, and then the public hearing and second reading on October 4th. So. I know that that is the desire of council relative to the goal to look at this in 2022. So that would still meet that timeline, but we are asking for a little indulgence and patience to go back and do some of that hardcore work and make sure that we've got the right balance. Mm -hmm. Yep, that sounds good to me. And then the only other thing I was yep. gonna ask you know, with the task force and South Metro Housing is, you know, to. You know, what are you do to get out into the community a little bit to hear some either feedback from them or also you know kind of let them know you know we did it with the envision about the importance of this as well but i think that's important as we're moving forward this that it's not just done 
um, transparency for the development, but transparency for this you know whole process. How we're going about this. And Any I, I think that uh, one page, <clears throat> or a couple pages on just um, AMI profiling right. the uh, profiling. That's all strange, but right. profiles of people that kind of um, the types of jobs and members of our community that that would be applicable to. I think that'll be a helpful next yeah. step to advance some of that community conversation. Just keep well. the conversation of what actually is this affordable housing. You know, it's it, you know it's it's non market rate housing for you know it's not necessarily um, you know lesser housing. It's uh, it's meeting a specific need that isn't being addressed right now. So. Yeah. And to and that <clears throat> point, real quick, just in terms of community engagement feedback, um, two things. First off, anyone who emails you guys that wants to talk about this stuff. If you don't want to talk to them about it or don't have the time or whatever, feel free to forward that to us. We're happy to sort of help host that conversation when it makes sense. Secondly, as some of you guys may or may not have known, in around the turn of the year, we put an ad in the Littleton report asking for applications for new members. So we have gone, just as two weeks ago, gone through the interview process for that, and we're adding some members. We also made some target had some targeted outreach and we now have a member from uh, the Littleton Hospital and LPS on our, because we recognize that those are major employers that have employees who oftentimes fit into some of these buckets we're talking about. So, Kyle, were you asking them to do education or more engagement? Both, I think. Yeah, I think both is important. And I, I, I would think engagement would be more than just getting a broader um, number of board members, but to actually somehow go out into the community through survey or some sort of forum to, you know, hear some of the issues that maybe we hadn't thought about that they would like to express. I think that would be a great idea. <coughs> One thing that I've been hearing, and this is maybe to mark to your point beyond the inclusive housing ordinance, is just the increased cost of rents that are happening right now. So that's not, a, you know, for new developments, but just currently people are being squeezed. I know my rent went up uh, considerably, my <clears throat> neighbors did, and those are folks, many do have fixed income seniors as well. So we're hearing that. So are there, is it there additional research that either the city can provide or the housing task force can do on what can we do as a city council to help address rents on current properties here in Littleton? Is there anything legislatively as well? I'd like that. Generally, research. now in terms of the rent control that was passed in 21, um, that only applies to new and redeveloped units coming online. So I'm not saying that there is no way for the city to help support or supplement what a lot of our residents are facing, but there's nothing that we could necessarily legislate against an existing, you know, apartment building right now. Can we explore that? What that would be? Yes, it would be illegal. <laughs> yeah, consider it explored. I mean, we can we can look at. I'm not sure what, what sort of options um, South Metro Metro Housing options may have. It would have to be vouchers, right? <clears throat> yeah, not many, and that's where I, <clears throat> I always go back to the housing preservation piece. That, that's one way. Yeah, yeah, and from a preservation standpoint, like so, so if you put city money into the acquisition of a property or in the development of property, then you get to say, we'd like some of these rents to be controlled effectively. Yeah. Um, if you're not putting city money into it, you really can't. And so there's no way to broadly say as a community, we're now going to say you can only raise rents 5% a year. It's illegal in Colorado. Um, and so there's no way to do that without saying, oh, now the city, and this is something that, you know, Corey's group does and, and some cities do is they look at aging multifamily and say, we're going to buy that. We're going to put city money into it. And now we can control the rents in that development. That's really what we think about from uh, on preservation strategies, but it requires injecting city money into a property in order to be able to extract it. You can't just do a blanket. We're changing, we're restricting rent appreciation is just, it's not. But the ownership aspect, you know, kind of working with land trust, doing deed mm -hmm. restrictions, depending on if the city becomes an ownership or an owner, even just having a minor ownership interest in a property, let's call it a special interest of 0.1% uh, in a in a project or a development affords certain tax breaks for, um, you know, whoever's operating that particular structure so you know they wouldn't have to pay certain use taxes on things things done in, in common areas it would certainly offset costs for when they have to do um, you know maintenance you know if they had to replace roofs things like that just by having 
the city has an ownership, they can avoid some of the kind of the hard costs, if you will. So there is savings involved, which could potentially that and, you know, if we're coming to the game and we're providing you with some sort of tax incentive or direct investment, then we have a seat at the table. And so we can certainly uh, dictate how, you know, the future management of that, those properties are going to be, and the future rents on that property are going to be. Okay. I'd love more research on that as additional options. If we can't do it. All right. Well, I just want to thank all the uh, uh, thanks guys in here. Thanks for coming. Yes, Great presentation. Very clear. It's, it's, not, it's not right. It's let's, let's take a, uh, a few minute break. Be back at eight fifteen. <laughs>
Yeah. All right, uh, everyone, all council's back. City attorney got lost. Um, That's how I felt. He's grabbing some material. <laughs> okay. Um, so Those next uh, topic is the open Everyone's space going. master plan update. We've got the public works director here to lead us, but I'll give it to the city manager so he can throw it over to Keith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And with that, I'm going to hand it right over to uh, Keith Reeser, our public works director, kind of start us off. Here. Every time that happens, um, uh, you, you probably all don't know this, but when I was younger, like 10, 11, 12, I worked as a television news reporter for a kids' TV news show in New York. And I, when I my first year at the main anchor was Jim, and he'd go, I'd have to go back to you, Jim, or he'd take to you, Keith. So every time Mark does that to me, I have a flashback of me like, well, uh, and sitting in a TV studio. I had a lot more hair then, I guess, uh, for sure. So um, Keith Reister, Public Works and Utilities Director. And so what we're here to talk about tonight is um, basically the last, our current open space, um, it's called Parks, Recreation, and Trails Plan. Um, was adopted in 2016 um, for the city. And, you know, we're in that window now, six years. It's about the right time to look at an update to significant plans like that. And uh, concurrently, um, South Suburban is just starting on their master plan update at the same time. And so what we wanted to do is come and spend a few minutes with uh, council to visit on the scope of work for this project before we put it out to consultants to make sure that it's reflective of what you're thinking in terms of the direction where we want to be heading uh, as a community. Uh, and normally Kelsey Stansfield would be here, but um, as I mentioned earlier today, we won't be starting this project until she gets back July 1st. Um, our newest Public Works Department member, Arlo, is... Uh, with her at this point in time. So um, kind of what we're going to cover tonight, just a quick history of open space, trails, that kind of thing, past plans and our operating agreement history with South Suburban. Um, recommendations uh, on the plan update, the scope of work and what we're thinking about for a schedule and then some feedback um, from you all to help us um, frame what we need to do. Um, so what you in the packet tonight, there's the set of slides there's the draft scope of work, and then there's the executive summary from the existing 2016 plan. So I pulled this out of the existing plan, which talks about basically what the goal of the plan was in the history. So to kind of put this, this sets the stage for kind of, the, we have the existing plan, there's been some previous plans before that, um, and the relationship that we have with South Suburban has been in place, we've had a relationship with them since the 1960s. Um, they had a name before that, they had a different name, and then they changed their name in the early 70s. And when we executed um, our existing operating agreement with them, uh, we originally did that in 1967, um, was the original operating agreement. And then there was an update done in 1974, and that really touched on um, provisions for if you add new park space or you acquire things, well, what are we going to do related to approving design? That's pretty much the extent of it. Um, so obviously, we do a lot of things today, both us in South Suburban and in our communities, which were not even contemplated in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so that kind of frames this. So you can see where I kind of touched on the first part. The second item there is we have a separate, uh, separating, separate operating agreement that's kind of a subservient to the bigger agreement, which focus is specifically on um, South Platte Park and that agreement was last updated and it was originally signed in 83 there was a small update in 87 which was more just housekeeping kind of stuff and we've been operating under those two agreements for the last you know basically 40 and 50 years so that sets what we have so those agreements to they include the basic outline of service provisions and an approval process for projects basically the operating agreement does not define values for either organization and what's important to them, what's the mission of what we're trying to accomplish and the goals we're trying to accomplish. It does not have defined levels of service or performance or how we're going to measure those levels of performance along the way, both for us as a city and for our partner in South Suburban. So what we're looking at here in terms of the process is we are going to put out a scope of work and we're going to um, bring in a consulting team that has experience in this type of specific plan and I'll cover the sections of that in a second. So we'll go through that process 
And based on the timeline we're looking at, it would probably put the conclusion of the plan planning process um, late in the year, probably December, late fourth quarter. So council would be looking at, I mean, they'd see drafts along the way, but they would see final, kind of probably final adoption around January of 2023. Following that, and concurrently, we would be having discussions with South Suburban about updating the operating agreement to replace the 1974 agreement and the 1983 agreement with one master agreement, which covers all of those areas today, which defines the things that we as a city believe are important, what the expectations are for us as a partner, what the expectations are for South Suburban as a partner, as well as I think it's important to enunciate the relationships how the two of us are also going to relate with a very important part of our um, situation, which was not contemplated in 1974-83, which is the amount of tax money that you get from Arapahoe County Open Space and their partnership level, or the influence of Mile High Flood District in a lot of our facilities, for example, as well. So to me, that's a place where we got to get to. Now, timing-wise with South Suburban, um, they recently did a, a new operating agreement with Lone Tree. It took them a year to get through that process from the time that they started the discussions um, to get to where they finished. Now, their agreement is more than likely, it's, it'll be its place to start, but it's also different than ours since we're, we're pretty much a community that's built out. She's getting choked up about it already. <laughs> <laughs> so exciting. Yeah, exciting. Um, whereas they're in an expansion mode, we're, we're not. So those will be just some of the things that we have to work through. So... Why is this important for us, like levels of service? For example, in our grounds area, which you're going to see in a study session here later this summer, we've completely revamped our approach to grounds and, and management and ir irrigation and landscaping. We have a defined plan. We have schedules for everything now across all of our facilities that we manage. We expect that out of our partners. That does not currently exist with our current partner that we can rely on. So... Those are the kind of things we think are important for great partnerships, both now and in the future. So the, com the components of the parks and open space scope of work that we would like the consultant to work on are, first, an existing conditions inventory and a gap analysis. So take a look at what we have, and then what's our gap between that and what we, some of the things we want. For example, trail connectivity, which we've identified in the transportation master plan and the bike and pedestrian plan. So where do some of those gaps exist? This would also tie into the inventory work that South Suburban will be doing as part of their project. Our, our portion of their inventory is, is small as a portion of their larger inventory as a district. So it's important for us to have our own standalone inventory to have it represent the values that are important to us that our community is outlined and envision and our other plans. We'll also have them take a look at current supply, demand, demographics, what's changing. You know, if I guarantee, I, I can assure you that the term pickleball is not in the 2016 plan, <laughs> but more likely will be in the 2022 update, yeah. for example, right? So those are the kind of things that we need to take a look at demographics. We need to take a look at things. I mean, I know, you know, for example, Jerry's really high on getting a new skate park. He can do some skating out there, <laughs> the skateboard out there, <laughs> things like that. I so didn't buy a new lacrosse stick. Well, that's true. I, I have several of those in my house at the moment. So, so we've got, you know, those are the kind of things. And this also ties into the work that South Suburban's <laughs> consulting team is doing as well. And they're a, it's scheduling wise, they're a little bit ahead of us, which is really good because we're going to be able to integrate their research and work into our work at the same time. Um, so they're not in parallel and they're going to mismatch. It's a chance for us to, you know, incorporate the work that they're doing into our planning efforts. Uh, public engagement, um, a plan like this requires a great deal of public engagement from, you know, the traditional meetings to pop-ups in parks and community trails, um, you know, online research, uh, surveys, and all those kind of things. So we're, we're, this is an area where a lot of creativity, we're going to be doing that during the summer, so it's a chance for us to get out in some of our facilities when they're being um, actively used um, so that we can really pull that kind of use in. It's, we'll do pop-ups on weekends, stuff like that as well. Um, acquisition analysis. This is an important component because we don't have a lot of things to buy in Littleton anymore. There's just not land to buy, which is a challenge for us in the sense that we don't, we're going to continue to get open space tax 
And one of the things that's in the in the new version that was just passed is um, you're going to see an I we're doing we just we're doing an IGA that enunciates the fact that hey we're going to give you money. We're going to come back to you with an amendment to the IGA with the county because we're going to go through the process of negotiating with the county staff, their open lands commission, and the county commissioners to allow us to, for example, move beyond the 20% that limit that was historically there for maintenance in operations to shift that to something that's more appropriate for our community. So in other words, you know, South Platte Park's a perfect example. Every year, more and more funds come out of the general fund to support operations of South Platte Park that we pay for. Well, working with the county, we're going to be able to move that, that gap back to the open space account and be able to cover that. So, but we need to go through the process of figuring that out with them. How does it work? And we've also agreed, Tiffany and I have also agreed to be the first guinea pig with them in the process to help them kind of develop the process they're going to go through with everybody else. The other thing that I want to kind of put on the table to think about is um, both Mark and I have operated in other regions of both Colorado and the country. And if you look at other regions of this state, um, there is a different philosophy than we see in the South Metro area related to partnerships between communities in acquiring open space. Um, for example, if you look at northern Colorado, there's a lot of communities that have partnered to create boundary barriers of open space between their communities to allow for a clear identification and separation. Those, many, many of those are just preserved as um, uh, agricultural sites with a coven over the top of them, as an example. Um, or there's several places, if you take like Larimer County, where you had the cities of um, Estes Park, Longmont, Loveland, Fort Collins, and Larimer County all going together to purchase an open space facility that's managed by Larimer County, but is not in any of the other jurisdictions. And it's that cooperation to bring together opportunities. And, you know, an example of this would be there's going to be a continued development, as we've talked about on the transportation and sewer side, going south down Santa Fe. And one of the things that we all know is most of our citizens have no idea where the borders are. They call and remind us that every day because so many people have Littleton addresses, but, you know, someone else provides their services, for example. But our, our, our citizens ac access those. And if we think about how many non-citizens, for example, access South Platte Park, you know, on a daily basis, it's a good number. So it's thinking about ourselves as a regional leader going forward. What's our vision and what role do we want to play as a regional leader over the next 10 to 20 years related to open space, parks, and recreation? Because if you think, I think, in listening to you and listening to the community, I think there's, there's, there's a want for a leadership in that, but I think a lot of people feel, feel that there's a little bit of a void there right now. So I think that's something we need to discuss in our values along the way as a, as a community. Um, and then the other deliverables obviously are going to be a draft of the plan all the, and then a set of recommendations and those kind of things, which you would normally see in a plan. And then finally, we'd work towards um, adoption. The other last item there is we're going to ask the consultants through their process to take a look at what would be a recommendation for citizen involvement in the future. You know, what, what role do we want to have our community members play in ongoing visioning and programming? In my time here, really the only thing we've done is the uh, open space task force we did to take a look at balancing our money and acquisitions a couple of years ago. So how do we want to engage in that going forward? And what do we expect out of our partner in South Suburban related to community engagement as well? So that's, that's kind of what the scope of work is. Our, our schedule is kind of what I just talked about, where we get the project going here in um, you know, July, most likely, hopefully, if everything falls <coughs> in place. Some of that will depend on availability of consultants because um, all of them are very busy right now. Um, so we'd look at a, some study sessions. You'd have at least probably two study sessions on this topic along the way. First one, talking about what's important to you and values. And then secondly, let's talk about the plan itself. Let's talk about the draft. Let's talk about concepts that are in the plan and work our way to a final plan adoption in the first quarter of next year and then work towards an operating plan update at that point in time. And I put May 2023 in there and I was being very, very, you know, I was being very aggressive and, you know, hoping that would happen in that time frame. So I can only say maybe the glass is 90% full when I was looking at that idea.
Um, so that is really the range of what I wanted to cover tonight with you all. I wanted to get your feedback on you know what's in the scope of work and if you feel like for, for me and more as a staff member it's what do you think is if there's anything that you think is glaringly missing or should be, <coughs> should be in there and then other thoughts about what you think is important as we go into this process. We, we can start talking now. I'm getting choked up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, I think it's. Uh, exactly. it, it looks good. It's very clear. I think it, it's a needed, a needed update, um, and I think it. I, I, the timeline looks great. You know, I think everyone on council kind of like to get things going as quickly as can, but we realize, you know, hey, that makes that makes sense. So I don't have any concerns or see anything glaringly missing. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, if I may suggest, you know, we have Councilmember Grove is uh, liaison to South Suburban, and Councilmember Milliman is the alternative. To, to that yeah, assignment. To the <laughs> alternate. Alternate. <laughs> 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 eh, she's our alternate. All right, sorry about that. She, she does have brown hair and I have red yeah, hair. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, we as staff have been working with Emma through a series of uh, monthly <coughs> meetings, roughly month, monthly. <coughs> so they may have a little uh, more insight on this issue here that they might be willing to share. <coughs> I'm Kelly, we'll go to Kelly yeah, first. Sorry. We'll go to the alternative. Yeah, sorry, we'll go to the alternative. I'll never be uh, let um, down. No, I think I would. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of history about why we pushed so hard for this open space plan and update. Um, I was liaison first with Karina and then now with Kelly Milliman. And I think we received a list from Kathleen of some of the areas of discord between uh, South Suburban and Littleton, and just to kind of give you some ideas of some of the details, South Suburban puts a very high priority on playgrounds, and a lot of their budget is on upgrading playgrounds, which is great, but that's a very narrow demographic. That's people with small children. And there's a whole group of other people that want to see other types of um, focus on trails and things like that. Um, there's been a real lack of focus for people that bike and walk and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's also been a little frustration about that lack of urgency. I think we saw this and we've all been involved in this with Jack Hill and the problems they had with people not being respectful um, to the neighbors coming late at night. And um, the it took us nine months and we finally got South Suburban to um, have a community meeting, which was great, but that took nine months. And in the interim, um, these people were suffering um, from these disrespectful partiers and people that came, especially during Alleged. COVID. It was aggravated during COVID. What? Alleged. Alleged. Yeah. <laughs> Your former prosecutor coming out. The, the alleged attorney has and to What was frustrating? <laughs> slander lawsuit going on was a real lack of empathy on the part of South Suburban and any solutions that we came up with in our meetings were not met very favorably. And it uh, finally took a safety issue where we had a fire and within weeks there were signs up there uh, limiting hours and, you know, saying no firecrackers, you know, um, certain rules and regulations and cross our fingers. It's not summer yet. It's not graduation season, but it's been quite a bit better according to the neighbors. So early indication is that it's working. But their process is very slow. And initially the process for Jackass Hill, and they pass this out, is to start here and have something maybe by 2023. And we only got lucky to get these signs because of the safety issue. So that's, it, it, it's their processes are kind of slow and they don't deviate um, from them. There's a lack of responsiveness on the Ashport issue where, um, Kelsey called them because we have a lot of ash board, a lot of ash trees, and no response. Uh, so there's a frustration about the lack of solution orientation. Um, there's also kind of a, a lot of resistance to modern techniques, uh, not only processes, but uh, one thing we've heard a lot about is nature play, and it requires a different approach to um, kind of play and also upkeep of those kinds of facilities. And we saw it at Reynolds Landing, and we saw it on the Highline Canal. A lot of resistance from South Suburban there. Also, Keith mentioned that our current plan does not match our ULUC, our transportation plan, not a lot of 
um, accommodation for biking and walking to the extent that I think that we would look at now. And there's a lot of focus on fee-based activities and organized activities. And um, as we discussed, our agreements in the past have been made from staff to staff without anything really written and no SLAs to, you know, how often do you mow? What What is our certain level of agreement? So all of this stuff kind of um, accumulates in the need to do this. And so I'm. it, it seems like early indication there's support from uh, the rest of council to move forward with this and update this um, along with South Suburban. And Kelly, I'm sure, has some. Do you have an alternative view? <laughs> no, she has additional views on things to say. <laughs> we don't need to plan. Um, yeah, I think I think this IPA definitely um, is a great step going forward to further strengthen the collaboration with South Suburban, improve it. Um, you know, as we, you know, think 10, 20, 30 years down the line, you know, our environment is changing um, and we have to pay attention and plan for that. And so we need that um, that forward thinking from our South Suburban. Um, we can't just be, you know, the same old, same old, same old and to, to move a little quicker on, um, on those changes. So I think the IJ is super, super important. As you all may or may not know, South Suburban had an election today uh, for the. We did. Do you have the results? We're still waiting for the avalanche updates. Went to their website and yeah, I didn't see anything. Right. So. No, I didn't either. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I would okay. encourage all of us, all seven of us, to really, you know, we have our meeting with them in June. It's a. Um, you know, it's our little get together in June. Let's bring coffee to keep those guys awake. And keep bring coffee. <laughs> bring the last bring cell phones at the front door. <laughs> yes. Sure. And I think we all. I think you know we need to start establishing a, a better dialogue with these board members yeah. to help them understand what our challenges are, what our values are as a community, and where we want to go forward. Um, and 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 really, you know, sort of forge better relationships with them so they understand. Um, yeah, you know what our what our goals are, um, and what our values are compared to what their values are too as well. So, um, highly encourage you to do that. Um, I mean, there's some exciting things that we can be doing going forward, but there's you know some challenges too as well. And um, I think Keith shared just recently, like uh, if you think about the Highline the Highline Canal, that. Um, there's no more water flowing through the canal, and so a lot of those cottonwood trees that have been there for a long time are not getting, you know, the hydration that they need. So eventually, they may come down. But rethinking about planting maybe more drought-tolerant species of trees going forward, so we can maintain that um, that Sequoia shade can't be sequoia cactus. <laughs> Native. That provides a lot of shade. <laughs> Maybe some, maybe some bloody arms. It's an alternative view. It is an alternative. So anyway, just thinking differently, and so I'm pretty excited about this. So yeah, mm -hmm. long overdue. Long overdue. Thank you, alternative Millman. As a side note, before before I go back to you, Mark, uh, the, uh, I would like to point out that South Suburban was adamant that we have this joint meeting between the board and the council before Mark left. So this is like the last morning Mark is your city manager. Oh. This is what he gets to spend and do it. Well, we make sense. So, you know, last minute <laughs> it's like a traffic suffering. Yeah. <laughs> also, they wanted to wait a lot longer. We wanted to get the new board in and get, get in there moving. early. And we really pushed, and Mark Good. pushed, and Keith pushed for a, not waiting for a long time. So some of them, may, uh, we don't know if we're going to have new people or not, but if we do, they may be a little bit deer in the headlights, but we'll get in there early. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Being a good advocate, it'll be a good. It, good yeah, it's, it's it's not always easy. <laughs> but I think you're highlighting like the fact that not only you're, we are pushing on this front, but there's a lot of other areas that we're updating ADA transition plans, our water resources master plan, transportation plans, and like I think we collectively have goals as a city, and I I don't want to just tack towards the middle. 
because no one else in SSPRD's you know, purview is doing the same things. So I'd rather push them to accommodate us rather than necessarily uh, just kind of default back to what they normally do because others are doing it that way. I mean, I think water resources planning being, I don't know, a thing I care about, uh, that, you know, that's that's a, a, a tough subject and it will require operational changes. It may require equipment changes, depending on the landscaping, you know, that can change how they do business. But I think that's what we need to be prepared to ask of them is change how you do business. Because oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Is there board meet? Weekly, monthly, quarterly? I think their board year? meets monthly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think their board meets monthly. So. Um, and, and they kind of just approve the budget, don't they? I mean, that's really their primary task. Yeah. I, I, I think the executive director reports to them. Right. Yeah, right. Correct. But um, so they, they get probably get less into policy than we do, from my sense. Yeah, they do policy. I've been to meetings. Yeah. yeah I mean, I don't know. Okay. It's, well, I'm just wondering if the board is really the right people to beat down. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a very fair point, too. Well, it be it's elected to elect. I mean, it, it's not say beat down. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not appropriate for me to, to, to get to go to Rob and say you have to do this. I, I, no, it's a partnership, know, right? Yeah, we, we yeah. elected to elected seems to be the way we've been doing it. And, Believe me, I've been on the phone with uh, Susie. You're the right person for the job. <laughs> that, that's actually a good point, too, is that like I think the conversation does involve Centennial. It does involve Lone Tree and us saying, like, hey, if we are going to get what we want out of these agreements, we also need to build some groundswell with their cities as well. Well, I mean, that's in a, from a staff perspective that like those things are important. For example, I spent part of this week working with Arapahoe County Open Space Arapahoe County Transportation, the city of Centennial and us to partner on a TIP application to create um, a grade separated crossing on Broadway for the High Line. Thank you. Huge safety. Yeah, it is. Very expensive, nine million bucks, but we're going to take an opportunity during the during the, the new TIP process, and but it takes partnership to execute on those. Um, so. Two good trees. Yeah, yeah. That would result in the beat down by a car. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, I would. Those are the kind of things where that partnership is yeah. elemental. That partnership is elemental for things like regional trail systems and those kind of things. So, I, I think you know that's really important for us to continue to build partnerships with our our peer cities as well. Well, and if they get to know us as a group. And we can build rapport and understand where we're coming from at the beginning of their term. I think that is a win-win for yeah. everybody. Well, this has been a long time coming. I mean, it's been five, six years that we've been yeah, really pushing sorry. those guys from the board as well as staff. I know you've been very involved with those guys. But I, I have talked to those people eyeball to eyeball in my own sweet way as I can be. Speak your mind. Powers Park and you know, final things like that. Speak your so. mind. Lay it out. So, Jerry so makes some cookies. Thanks, and Keith, for, for getting this going I where you are I think they today. finally put a bench in. They did. Oh, yeah. A while back, yeah. yeah. I, it was still, I ripped some that, on Yeah, that. that took a long time because they couldn't secure it. And it was... It's, they didn't it, hold it. No, no. Just, they, they, they gave didn't allegedly. Us, how's the excuses? <laughs> and and I, I didn't accept excuses. I was done. Well, it's just I think there's some ways to find solutions instead of always... They gave excuses. What, what, what do we pay South Suburban to manage our parks, Keith? Approximately. We get a lot of mills. They get a property yeah, tax. They they right. I don't know. Like right. Ten mills? mills? I want to we say. We get ten mills. mills. We only get. No, I don't know. We we had uh, a couple of years ago. They did a baseline analysis on that for us. We have that. Um, I mean, we do pay. We do pay the operations for Southwest Park. Right. So. Yeah, right. That's us. We, we definitely pay for, we pay for that, which is an anomaly amongst regional park management within South Suburban. So that'll be some up for discussion. Yeah. Now, also, they're building a ten million dollar um, uh, tennis bubble. Yeah, replacement for the tennis bubble. Although I I begged them for a restaurant, and I still don't know if there is anything in there. Just hoping for a pickleball indoor. <laughs> I mean, there's a beautiful yeah, restaurant at the uh, golf course over on Colorado Milton Boulevard, South Suburban, overlooks the golf so course. <laughs> Trying to mention a nice restaurant here was not well. Well, part of what happened, I mean, we're one of the original <clears throat> customers going back to like 
59 or something like that. Then they, as they expanded east, way east, we became not important. important to them. So over the last 10 years is when we've been putting a lot of heat on them. Okay. Great. One, uh, one, go ahead. I just have one quick question. I assume the tra uh, ADA transition plan will play a part in this as well. Ab absolutely. Okay. In fact, last night we had our open house um, for that, and we expect to have that up for you for adoption here in a couple weeks, which is exciting. But yeah, one of the things that we really looked at, if you look at the data in the plan, a lot of that is really tied to the connectivity in and around parks related to ADA and just general accessibility. So that'll play a big role. Great. I'm excited about the yeah. discussions about regional partnerships and pulling that together and <coughs> having those connections. Mark. I'm really, really excited about it. Yeah, just um, you know, a couple of comments here. Certainly I've had a fair amount of conversation with Rob Hanna, the executive director of South Suburban. I think they would certainly welcome this opportunity to kind of reinvent the relationship. They, they know that uh, things have changed. You know, they don't probably know quite to the depth here that the council may be expressing here. So I, I think the June 1st is an opportunity for us to reinforce the message. Um, I think also as part of the agenda for June 1st is uh, going to be Hudson Gardens. And I'm working with Rob now to try to figure out what that agenda will look like. But, you know, that's an interesting relationship that's gone on for a very long time. It's a wonderful asset in our community. South Suburban owns that. They have a foundation that kind of helps... Uh, make recommendations about the operating of this thing. But, you know, obviously COVID, they took a big hit with that thing and uh, no concerts and the like. And so I, I know they're going to be wanting to discuss with us, you know, what is the vision of Hudson Gardens? How do we want to see that facility in the future? Um, we have historically contributed to that in a capital sense, you know, a couple hundred thousand every once in a while. So it's, you know, I kind of question what's, what do we want out of this as the city? How do we want to be involved in this in the longer term? So I think that's a conversation. Get a restaurant where you throw peanuts on the floor. <laughs> uh, that's Texas not Pam's expectation. <laughs> Texas. We used to have one. That would kill me. That would kill me. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So it was great. Northwoods. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I think there's a lot to be had here in a conversation with their board and. Uh, you know, obviously, it is, uh, it's got a long history here in Littleton. I think it's just time to add that to the mix here in our conversations on the Great. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Good job. Well, we're going on. Thanks. Uh, any report? Yes, I just, um, there's a group of residents there adjacent to the town of Gomar who have, have been working with the town on a sidewalk project. I know uh, I can't remember Driscoll, I was going to say alternative, just as a joke. But, uh, um, he's been involved here for the last couple of years. You know, this is an issue that's largely between the property owners who are in Littleton, but it's Bomar's project. They have a meeting here Thursday on a, a proposed plan. I know that the residents had copied all of the council. So this is just a, a quick diagram of what the plan is from Bomar. And we'll let that conversation play out. I know Councilmember Driscoll is going to be attending that meeting here on Thursday. So if anybody calls you or emails you, you can send them my way. Okay. okay. Well, first in. It, it's so. It, it's just a walkway for, for kids to go to school. That's all it is. Um, but yes. it's that's what they do. It's going across a, a little to easement. It's not going across, but it's a little to easement. We're looking to widen road and and make it more safe uh, for the kids to walk. Got her. And, and, and thank you for letting us know who's responding and what's going on because they don't need nine, you know, seven different. Yeah, answers. I mean, this is really a, a BOMAR project. And yeah, they're going to fund it and everything through their Arapo uh, or Jefferson County funds, I think. Yeah, yeah, because they're so small. I mean, they have a staff of, what, like two people um, work. That's all volunteer. Because yeah, it, I mean, we end up getting involved over there. some of it. So. I mean, this is within Bomar's right of way. It's not anything that the city of Littleton has any control over. They have the right to actually expand that roadway right there. They put that trail in. I didn't so. think Bomar. I didn't think Bomar owned it. I think that was Littleton, but they're offering to pay for it. Let's not change their mind. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, my update. that's it. City attorney, any update? Yes, I have several. Thank oh, you. good. Oh, good. Um, eager. I just wanted to 
let council know that um, your executive session packets are in your lockers right now. So if you guys want, lockers? if you want to head up there, I will show you where your new lockers are. I, I got, I got an appointment. I, I do too. <laughs> we got state of the city tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. Yes. Morning. Uh, Can you bring those packages? Uh, yeah. Can we do that? I don't know what your locker codes are. No, that's true. I don't know. <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> you text us. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, Lucy's on vacation here, yeah. so I, 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 I can't know. get in. I went to grab them. Yeah. Um, do you have to just walk up there again? They're in this. Well, they're in the spot next to the deputy clerk in the small. You know, we used to house an employee, but right next to the window. Why are they yeah, down the, at the front? Um, the preference from a security perspective was to keep them inside the building versus up in the front. When we talk front them. where they used to be. Yeah, when we talked to the staff, yeah, the staff. Water. So, you know, we're we're getting ready, as you can see. You know, we we're going to quarantine the mayor and all that plastic out there tonight when we came in, but we like to let him come in. So, you know, so we're making that construction's ongoing in the um, on the other side of the community room right now. Cool. So, as like you said, stay in the city tomorrow, seven thirty a.m. So, everyone, you're not going. Anyone else planning on going there? All right, see you bright and early, so yeah. we're adjourned. All right.